This is the D6 Generation with your hosts, Craig Gallant. Oh, if you're getting any compensation, it's not charity. Russ Wakeland. You put me on a boat with freaking dragons attacking me and whatnot? Now nah, we're talking. And Garrett Wong in the third chair. Like a snake through a tube, Captain. With contribution from Total Fangirl. Vampires do not sparkle. And our loyal listener. Are you crazy? That's like 400 hours of gamer nonsense. Welcome to another edition of Rapid Fire, the roundtable discussion of all things gaming. Coming out of the speed of a Starfleet ensign being transported 40,000 light years through a Sakari spatial trajector. Today's edition is brought to you by our fine patrons over at Patreon, such as Jeremy, Neil McLaughlin, Scott Barcuda, Jesse, Duncan Allen, and Roland Steiner. Join these fine individuals and many more by checking out our Patreon page at patreon.com and look for the D6 generation. I'm Geekly McNardigan, your host. Today, our panelists are Russ Wixaban Wakeland and the inestimable actor, entertainer, and prodigal gamer, Garrett Weyoun Wong. Let's begin. <laughs> Issue number one. Star Trek Voyager was the first official program to air on the United Paramount Network during its inaugural season in 1995. Of all the programs that were part of the UPN's inaugural season lineup, including Pigsty, Plat- Platypus Man, uh, Marker, Nowhere Man, and Legend, Voyager was the only show to survive its first season. Question, what Star Trek alum starred in the sci-fi western adventure Legend with Richard Dean MacGyver Anderson? Westy Postley Ramus Ross. Oh, man, George Takai, I had no idea. Uh, Geezer Garrett. (laughs) Bob Picardo. Oh, that would be John Q. Delancey. Oh, yes. Ah. Uh, If only he had been able to use his Q powers, that show might have lived more than one year. Issue number two. There are many things that might save a character, an actor, or an entire show, and publicity is one of the most powerful. Although they say that no publicity is bad publicity, there are some times that are definitely better than others. Let's say, I don't know, being named one of People, People Magazine's 50 Sexiest Men in the World. Question. In 1997, the year a certain Star Trek Voyager actor was named the top 1050 list, what actor was on the cover of that issue? Gavin Rosdale Russ. Uh, Pee Wee Herman. Cuba Gooding Garrett. <laughs> oh, Brad Pitt. I don't know. Oh, that, that was close. I think you missed, you missed it by one year. It was George Clooney, of course. Oh. <laughs> Come on, guys. Who else? And in a very interesting twist of fate, he was dating a lawyer in 1997, too. What are the chances? <laughs> Issue number three. In any military endeavor, one must plan carefully the tactical and strategic objectives as well as the practical personal personnel and logistics aspects of one's command. When all of this is wrapped into an operation with multiple objectives stretching across multiple targets or theaters, it is often referred to as a campaign. Question. In 1999, what cult horror movie's shoestring ad campaign is considered to be the most successful of any movie to date? Arlington Road, Russ. Oh, oh. I got nothing. The Ninth Gate Garrett. Uh... Toxic Avenger. Ooh, good one. No, oh, that was a classic. Uh, unfortunately, no, that makes you both wrong. It's the Blair Witch Project. Oh, yeah. oh. The movie itself oh, cost yeah. 22000 and ended up profiting over $250 million. Much of the film's success was tied to a grassroots marketing campaign that predated Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, and even Friendster. Now that's a campaign. <laughs> Issue number four. In the Star Trek experience, combining Star Trek and Las Vegas do very cool things on their own, visitors were treated to a great museum, Quark's Bar, and the Deep Space Nine promulgate promenade arena uh, area and a couple awesome simulator rides where one could encounter either the borg or the klingons in an immersive fun experience that tied directly in with the local las vegas scene question which alien race did my completely allergic to sci-fi wife immediately identify with and interface with for all the rest of our day rem and russ i'm gonna go with tribbles goran garrett i'm gonna go with the klingons no, no, though, no, you're both wrong again. The Ferengi, that damn quark <laughs> recreationist, swept in with a suave, flattering banter that would have made Armin Shimmerman jealous and had her wrapped around his pinky for the entire day despite giant ears and a bulbous head. That's it for now. Thanks for listening and good night. Did she touch his lobes? I think she did, now that you mention it. This episode of the D6 Generation is brought to you by... GameSalute.com. Check out gaming news or find out what the new hotness is on Springboard. GameSalute.com. And by Battle Foam. Protecting your army so you don't have to. And the War Store. Bringing the war to your door since 1999. And that is for a decade or more. And by... 
Conquistador Games. Focusing on immersive and thematic games. More details at cqgames.com. Hello! 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 Hey, and welcome to episode 149 of oh, so close. the D6 Generation. I'm Russ Wakeland. I'm Craig Gallant. And I'm Garrett Wong. Hey, no way! It's, it's Enz and Kim, Craig, on the show! We finally, we finally have a start. We've made it, Russ. We've we, really, really made it. <laughs> Garrett, thank you so much for joining us. We are oh, so excited to have you here today. We cannot tell you how excited our fans are that you're here with us on the show, too, Garrett. This is awesome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. We're so happy to have you. So our friend Terrace with Geek Nation Tours uh, set us up and said, hey, Garrett, would, would like to come talk on the show. We're like, that'd be awesome. We'd love to have him. So so here we are, and um, we're going to talk with Garrett about uh, his you know his various uh, his sundry adventures around the world. But first, we have to have achievements in gaming. That's right. Um, so uh, let's go right to that and go right to there. So first of all, Craig, before we do that, though, we should talk about the Lost Chapters. We really should quickly briefly. talk about the Lost Chapters. Yes. Yeah, so if someone wants extra content, let's say our typical, you know, Three four hour, hours every other week is four, not enough for you. Right. You want even more content, which is just ridiculous. But let's say you did. What would people do, Craig, to, to get that information? Well, you see, Russ, we have this awesome fiscally responsible plan where we give you four hours for free and charge you for the extra 45 minutes. Right. So the best way to get that, of course, would be by going to the website, checking out on the uh, right-hand margin, clicking uh, the Lost Chapters, or even better, go to our Patreon page mm -hmm. and check it out. Check out our little video, see what we look like and why we do radio. And uh, you'll be able to jump on there, support the show, give a little tip every episode. You don't pay any more than you want to pay. You could give it as little as a penny and as much as, you know, I mean, we would never want to set an upper limit. But um, <laughs> right. And that's if you give $2 or more per show, you get all those Lost Chapters for free. So that would be the great way. Be part of the show. Support the show and, uh, and and get in there and get those lost chapters. That's 45 minutes of gold, folks. Exactly right. So what's the time now for, Craig? Uh, right about now, it's time for Achievement. <laughs> really? It's an enforcer. I am an enforcer. <laughs> you have the uh, wrong setting. See, this achievement. No. no. Oh, wait. No. Whoa. Right. Whoa. Amateur hour. <laughs> achievement. No. Wait. What is going on? I don't know. Wait. Let me go all the way to the top. Let me go all the way to the top. Here we go. Achievements in gaming. <laughs> it is yes, folks. We are professional. 149 Sorry. episodes. Still can't get that bit right. I'm excited. We are no good. Garrett's here. So Garrett's uh, here. Achievements in gaming is brought to us by Biddybots. Check it out. That is all. Bitly slash Biddybots. That's b i t dot l y slash Biddybots. All right. So in this first part here, and, and we hear this noise, people. Don't panic. That is yes. the achievement sound, meaning that someone has mentioned something of geeky goodness in their past. They have achieved <laughs> something. <laughs> right. So, so Garrett, let's, let's start with you. So uh, we know that you right now you're kind of haven't played games in a while, but you did you get involved in games in high school or earlier in your life? Uh, yeah, it was probably more like I would say junior high school, yep. or middle school, more seventh or eighth grade. That's when I that's when I first started playing a little bit of D&D. &D. Ooh, role-playing uh, games. Nice. Yep. Now, now, what did, what got you into Dungeons and Dragons from the uh, more traditional uh, board game type world? Um, I, just interested in that that genre of yep. of gaming, I, I suppose. You know that that's that kind of world that that held interest to me. So, Very now, cool. were you uh, always like a fantasy fan? Yeah, that's the main cool. thing. I mean, I, and, I love fantasy and sci fi back then. So, no, now, 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 outside of, of course, the one glaring example. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you still like a fan of of sci fi and fantasy, or has that kind of become the the classic? It becomes the job, and so uh, you want to look elsewhere for your free time, sort of thing. No, no, I think I've always been a sci fi and fantasy fan. Uh, even though I played on a, a sci fi show, it didn't it didn't uh, bore me or or turn me away. <laughs> I'm still, <laughs> well, good. I'm still That's part good of it. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, oh, you know what? I, can I just say a random weird story here? Yeah, sure, please, please do. Said, yeah. Um, I, so years ago when I was in college, um, my roommate told me, oh yeah, my older brother's coming by, you know, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, to visit me. I said, okay, cool. Um, he was also a student at UCLA, but he was, it, he was ahead of us. And, um, he came by and I just remember this guy had, was just so socially awkward and that he, he just, he didn't even look up. He get looking at the floor when I was talking to him, just, just a guy who you would think, Oh my goodness, he'll, he'll never get a date. He'll never kiss a girl. He'll never, you know, and, um, we've all been there folks. So yeah, so years later, you know, after I'm out of college, I, I, I call my old roommate up just to catch up with him. And, and, um, I said, you know, how's your older brother? You know, is he okay? You know, how, how's he been? And he said, oh, yeah, he's pretty good. He's pretty good. Yeah, he started a company called Blizzard. And I said, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So anyway, so Mike Morheim. Mike Morheim is my uh, my roommate, Rich Morheim's older brother. Wow, so, that's uh, awesome. Oh, well, that, you yeah. get an achievement for that, no, Gary. That's, 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 that's awesome. worth an achievement right there. It is. All right. It is. See, so all that Dungeons & Dragons led to uh, someone to, to writing an entire uh, MMO and breaking a there whole we are now one Exactly. <laughs> We are now one degree of separation from Blizzard. Right. right. Yes, you are. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> That's very cool. Very cool. Yeah, and the funny thing was his older brother was in the engineering fraternity yep. called Triangle at UCLA. Yep. And they yep. happened to be across from the fraternity that I had joined. Um, and we had some guys in the front upper uh, – I guess the front upper room that used to love to blare their stereo at crazy hours in the morning, waking up all the neighborhood. But the, the, this literally the stereo was faced toward the triangle fraternity. <laughs> Evidently, uh, Rich Morheim's older brother, Mike Morheim, the founder of Blizzard, um, he and a couple of other cohorts found a way to remotely turn off the stereo of the <laughs> offending <laughs> individuals in my fraternity. <laughs> so awesome. they use their they use their tech savvy yeah. back in the you know we're talking about the the mid eighties and late eighties. Yeah. Uh, they figured out how to shut down the stereo across the that's, street. That's awesome. And, oh yeah, late, it was the Revenge of the Nerds. A, right. I was gonna say he, later they made a movie about that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> right. There you go. They use geek powers for good. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So uh, Craig, what have you been playing lately? Uh, well, let's see. Um, bang the dice game made okay. a, uh, made a, made a re, uh, re, re emergence locally lately, which is, of course, a lot of fun and a lot of fast and a, a lot of fast, a lot of fun and very fast. Yes. And I, uh, am still no good at it whatsoever. <laughs> and I can't pretend to be the, I can't pretend to be the, um, the deputy when I'm not the deputy. And I can't convince anybody that I'm, uh, not the deputy when I am. So, uh, I'm constantly getting shot. I was, think I was the second one dead in all three games we played. Really? So that was, that was rough. Um, played, uh, uh, actually ran a big demo of Dead Zone last night. Oh, nice. How did that go? Very fun. That went a lot of, that went really well. I think we got two more recruits in. Yay. Um, uh, Shifty Will and, uh, and Chris Therian both played and enjoyed it. Although I am learning that I can't have the Rebs be one of the um, factions when you when you do a demo because they kind of get crushed. But oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, especially when they're going up against those enforcers and their power armor and their jump you, packs you, and their you, power weapons and machine guns and yeah, it's just. You it think was giant okay. space teleporting turtles though would do okay? Yeah, you can't really fit one yeah. of those into a thirty-five point demo game. Uh, okay, though. fair enough. I, we, he tried. <laughs> Like you could, you could have one giant teleporting turtle and that one, uh, drone yeah. without a gun. But, um, yeah, so that was a lot of fun though. And, uh, that's about it for me. It's been a little sparse. Yeah, it's been sparse. What about you, Russ? So I've been playing, uh, as longtime listeners know, I'm still playing my Descent campaign. So, so Garrett, Descent is kind of like, uh, Dungeons and Dragons light. So there's none of that pesky pre-game thing where you got the dungeon master's got to sit down and think up a really epic story and write all that up. <laughs> no, in this game, you just, it comes with, it's basically a board game with a bunch of little miniatures, uh, you know, monsters and, and heroes. And then you slap together some puzzle pieces that make a little dungeon on the board. And one player plays the overlord trying to kill, not make a fun story, but actually stop and kill the heroes who are trying to solve some little puzzle or something in the game. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of like a little Dungeons and Dragons one off, but then. And we're now, playing, if okay. I'm not mistaken, actually, with Geek Nation Tours, Garrett actually has, uh, a session of Descent scheduled, I think. I think you might. So you might Ooh. be able to see this first. So you'll game. get a chance to, chance to re, reestablish your roots, so to speak. Exactly. Go back to huh. the dungeon crawls. It's a really, really okay. fun game. Now, it's now, Garrett, really do you remember what your character was back when you played D&D? Yeah, I had a I had a paladin. Oh, nice! So, of yes. course yeah. you did. Great. Yeah, I always find, the goody two shoes. I, I, I find I those, know as as overlord, I play evil overlord in, in the descent campaign. I find paladins to be very pesky. 
Um, <laughs> they, they, they not only do they kill monsters, but they keep the heroes alive. It's very frustrating. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, so I have a good time with this. We got to the interlude, which is the midpoint of our campaign. Um, and had a good run, good battle, but the heroes managed to pull it out. So they are still up on me about two games to one. So this is a, so basically you've won one game in the last three years. Well, if you're going to put it that way, yes. Yeah, I'm <laughs> yes. just saying. I mean, but full yeah, disclosure. You know, yes, full disclosure. But I'm still having a great time with it. So uh, yeah. Been... Well, that's that's the mark of a good game, folks. Yes, when you get your it. butt kicked that's for right. three years straight fun. and still have a smile on your face. <laughs> so, so modeling is another category we talk about, Garrett. And these are games that actually have involved like assembling little stuff, and and for the really geeky folks out there, assembling things, painting them up, and then using them in the middle of your games for things like that. And I've been actually painting and assembling some of my more Descent stuff. So the Descent comes all pre-assembled, little plastic board game pieces, but they look so cool because they're little dragons and little guys. So I get together with my daughter sometimes, and we paint these little models up, and it's it's good fun. So I've been working more on that and get my lieutenants painted up, Craig. And that's cool. really all I've been doing lately for modeling. How about you? Well, I was going to ask Garrett. Garrett, back when you were playing D anD D, did you guys use miniatures like those old Ralpartha miniatures that we were using? No, no. No, you guys were all theater of the mind sort of yeah, guys, pretty much. Yeah, see, well, see. you know what? Then you didn't have to paint, so that's good. No, <laughs> I, I don't see how you, I, I don't have the patience or the 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 steady hand to paint anything that tiny. I think I think that's such. A skill. I'm, I'm impressed when people, other people do it. Uh, well, I mean, you may be surprised. There may be a painter hiding in you yet. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll, 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 maybe we'll nail you to a chair at Gen Con and have you uh, teach you a lesson. No, I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't teach when I'm off the clock. But anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah. So what have I been doing? I'm still doing basically the same project I was talking on uh, talking about last episode. So focusing on finishing up those chaos ball teams. Uh, I'm still working on the second of the last four and the ringers. Uh, they're, they're really fun. I mean, it's, it, the painting, those are fun because you're not painting a whole army. There's not like a hundred guys. You're literally painting two of the bruiser fighter guys and three of the runner smaller guys. And then you're done. Then you move on to the next team. So it's, it's really a, a very cool. And it's really, you can see it developing quickly in front of you. I, um, still working on, a double starter for Plague for Dead Zone and uh, just ordered more uh, online. So uh, that'll be cool. And I'm working on those enforcers because I still haven't quite decided what I'm going to play. Uh, although I have a billion rebs, so despite their weaknesses, I think I'll probably stick with them. Right, there you go. And uh, that's what I've been doing as far as modeling goes. Okay, so now it's time for other geeky goodness. This is uh, reading any good sci-fi fantasy books or whatever or movies. Now bring it home, Garrett. Shows or... So, so Garrett, <laughs> you are do you read any? Are you reading any books lately? Uh, you know what? I just finished. Um, well, I'm up to date on all the uh, Walking Dead graphic novels. Okay, right. um, oh, I just nice. I just went through another graphic novel called Scalped. I don't know if you guys have read that. Oh, I've not. Was, What's that about? Uh, set on a Native reservation, basically Native American reservation, oh, about cool. the opening of a casino and um, all the craziness that ensues. But it's it's really well done. So. Ooh. I'm impressed by that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's really in the same subject matter or not. Is it kind of? Sort of? Yeah, no, by the good. fact that it's a graphic novel yeah. that fits in well. You're in, okay, you're good. in the genre. Right. Good. right. Very cool. Um, how about, do I, so Craig, what have you been watching or reading lately yourself there? Well, you got me into Orphan Black. Oh, yeah. And so I started watching Orphan Black and then I binge watched it. So I've think? now like watched seven episodes in two days. Isn't it good? Uh, it's great. It's awesome. I'm really engaged with the characters. I think it's very cool the way it's incorporating all these little near future technologies, but it's, it's happening right now. Um, the one woman who plays all the clones, uh, oh, spoiler alert, yeah. <laughs> uh, is, uh, she's amazing. She's, she's amazing I mean, actress. she's crazy. Yes. Although you can detect her English accent in almost everyone, even yes. the, in, in the, the housewives and stuff, but, yeah. uh, but, but still she's, she's crazy, crazy good as an actress. Um, so I'm really, really enjoying that. And I finally finished listening to, um, The Wise Man's Fear. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, so then I thought, oh, everybody's talking about Brandon Sanderson. Brandon, his name is Brandon Sanderson. It's not yes. Brian. It's Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> uh, his new, uh, solo, uh, meaning he's doing it on his own as opposed to continuing the Wheel of Time, uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Way of Kings has, is, is, has is been bandied about as this book I have to read. I have to listen to the, the, it's amazing. It's got multiple, uh, voice actors, blah, 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 blah. So I went to Audible, which of course is an awesome ref, uh, resource. Yep. 
for us. Now, we have an offer going right now we, for listeners. How does that work? Well, how it works is if you go to our website and click the Audible icon in the corner, you will get access to the entire Audible library as well as a deal to join Audible for free for 30 days and get a free Audible credit, which means that you can pick just about any book for the library and it's yours to keep forever even if you cancel your subscription yep. and never pay a dime. Which is an awesome deal. But the really cool deal is that you get access to all of their sales for mm-hmm. an entire 30 day period for no That's cost right. to you. So right now there's actually a sale going on a two for our three for two sale. Yep. I find so. audiobooks, audiobooks are just the ultimate way to, to really read because you got those times of the day when you're, you know, you're mowing your lawn or you're in the commute uh, or you're, you know, whatever you're doing and you can't actually um, do anything else. You can listen to a great story while you're on your way to work. I love it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And so I got, uh, the way of Kings and I thought <coughs> I'm back in the saddle. Everything's going to be fine. I'll get, I'll, you know, I let my credits go for a few months while I listened to that enormous book, uh, the wise man's fear. And then I looked and I saw that the way of Kings is 42 hours long. So, uh, okay. this will be, this will be taking a while also. And although it is intriguing, the, the, the voice act, there's a male voice actor and a female voice actor. The female voice actor is great. She sounds very familiar to me. I, I haven't done a, a quick Google search to see what else she's done, but I'm almost positive she's done other books that I've listened to. The guy is very dramatic. He's very dramatic. <laughs> and so as he looks over the stone plains, it's like, wow, okay, uh, calm down. Um, but you know, the, the, it's, an, it's brought up an interesting thing in my head where with fantasies, because coming off of the wise man's fear, which of course is, I mean, they, they talk about oak trees, they talk about, you know, the fish are the same kind of fish and the animals are mostly the same kind of animals. And in the way of Kings, basically Brandon Sanderson is creating almost an entire world where Every animal is different. Instead of cows, they have these giant crab things. Oh. Uh, instead of grass, they have these like weird eel vegetable things that come out of rock holes. And, and I'm starting to realize, you know, I don't, I, I can't really get into that. I mean, it's, it's almost like sci-fi, the level of world if, if building. If everything's different, done. then you can't relate, right? Is that part it, of the problem? And that's yeah. my issue right now is, yeah. uh, but he's doing really cool things. He, he, uh, there's a lot of race relations mm-hmm. and power relations going on in the book. And instead of using the standard relations that we're used to, he's created all of these new things. For instance, uh, the upper echelons of society all have light eyes and the people who have dark eyes. So I'd be out of luck. But, um, you know, they're all looked down upon. So it's a very interesting. He's kind of, sort of like taken that race politics and re- uh, taken out all of our baggage and sort of put it in so you can look at it sort of new, mm. which is an interesting. So there's a yeah. lot going on in the book that's really interesting but I'm having a very hard time getting into it because every time you turn around, there's a big giant cow crab. <laughs> so, cow crab. So there's that. Um, cow crabs. I did just finish Containment Protocol, which yep. I was talking about last episode, which is the anthology from Mantic Games that is based around their dead zone. And I have to say, I was really, really happy, really impressed. Ross Watson, our friend of the show, mm-hmm. uh, has a, a short story in there. It's really, really good. There's a lot of really good stories in there. And, and I was, I was really nervous because as is usually not the case when you go to a fan based forum, like the mm-hmm. Mantic forums, and you look at like, oh, look, they've got a, they've got a, uh, an anthology that they just put out. I'm curious. What's, what are people saying? Usually when it's the company's own forum, people are very well behaved and they're very positive. It was like, I mean, it, it was like everybody thought they were a literary critic off the New York Times or something. <laughs> And it was like, oh. I thought he used far too many adverbs. And I was like, wow, this is, <laughs> it's going to stink, but I, I really enjoy the world. So I want to get into it. And, and it, I mean, there were some typos. There was no more than the average typos that I find in, um, genre yeah. or IP literature anyway. And so certainly nothing that took me out of the story. Uh, so I really enjoyed it. So if you're interested in Dead Zone at all, or you're looking for like an antho- a cool sci fi anthology, it's only available as an ebook. Um, which I've learned you do because you don't need a li- con- Library of Congress number to do that. Yeah, but sure. um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I thought it was really cool and I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, and that is pretty much all I've been. I'm almost done with my book. That's cool. I just that's actually exciting. submitted my author's my clean author's copy to the editor. So that's three in a year and a, and a month. That's so crazy. That's crazy. gotta be worth something. Yeah, it's worth something. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, here's what I've been watching. So, Garrett, you jump in here if there's any of these shows you've seen. So just let me know. Okay. Uh, do you watch a lot of TV or are you kind of 
I do. Yeah. All right, cool. So, so have you watched Arrow? You watching that show? No, it's, but you know, everyone's telling me about see, that. I was, I just got back from England where David Ramsey, I met David Ramsey, the oh, actors wow. David Ramsey right. and Selena Jade, who are both on Arrow. Yes, so. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, so here's the thing about the show because, you know, as, as, as name most, dropping is, no, that's is, cool. It's, it, no, 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 no. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. I was, it's encouraged. If you let, if encouraged. You let me talk, yes. Ross, all right, fine. I was going to say it goes to a whole new level with Garrett on the right. show. Right. It does. We, Usually it's like I is, talked to uh, well, Eric awesome Summerer and um, right. well this is great Craig because now we have one degree of separation to all these great people. This is, I, awesome. this is great. So so um, I was <coughs> when I first came out I'm like well it's about Green Arrow so I'm going to watch it because I'm a geek and it's about comic book characters so and I got about halfway through the first season and for some reason my wife and I just stopped watching it and then some of my friends are like you know season two is just fantastic you got to get would back be into me. it uh, yeah and our friend Ian from the Nerd Herders also is really excited about it so I started watching again got through the middle of season one and now i'm near the end of season one and it's getting really good again you so, haven't even gotten to season two no, yet. no still in season one. Oh, russ so it, it's uh, so well, now i don't like comic books so i didn't know it was about a comic book i yeah. was like oh it's cool it's about this guy who shoots arrows that's Neat. green arrow man come on yeah no i know now <laughs> not a <laughs> but, total idiot but here's but here's the thing about <laughs> it that's it gets me confused see because this is a it's like 24 episodes in the first season, and I've been watching all these BBC shows, which have like six episodes in a season, so 24 episodes to me is like, you know, three seasons, So, but right. but yeah, it's been great, so I can't wait to get to season two and hear all the really good stuff, but so far it's been been great, so I'm really liking oh, the that. the season finale is awesome. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. Um, season still, two finale. We already talked about Orphan Black, still loving that. Yeah. Um, now, I'm, you're in season two on that one, right? I am. I'm, I'm in, all I'm so, season one. Yeah, season two is airing now, and I'm watching it as they come out. So we're all caught oh, up right now. Can't wait for the next episode. It gets really crazy in season two. So it's yep. um, really mm-hmm. good. Uh, and, and again, if you haven't seen the show, as Craig mentioned, it's not really a spoiler because right from the first episode, you pretty much know that there's this woman and there's these clones. And so this it keeps the budget low because there's this one actress that basically plays <laughs> half the characters. But she's really good. Of course, that poor girl doesn't get a break, though. No, she doesn't. Um but what's also funny about the show is that it take it, it's clearly intending to take place in New York, but the only moment there's ever any New York footage is the very first episode. After that, it's clearly someplace in Canada, so uh, Vancouver or someplace. But um, but yeah, it's, it's a really good show. Uh, also, I'm finally catching up on Once Upon a Time, mm-hmm. which is the show where all the uh, storybook characters are alive and well in our world. Um, and, and on ABC, so they're all Disney characters, and I think I mentioned this last time that I have to catch up now because my daughter's discovered that Elsa from Frozen is going to be on it soon. So <laughs> you see, now I have to catch up and watch it. So wow, they're not up. wasting any time there. No, well, actually, they just had a cameo from um, uh, Wizard of Oz, which was probably a tie-in back to the Oz movie from last year. So that's right, there. Yeah. So they're yeah, just, they're they're pretty shameless about throwing in all the all the hooks there. I'm um, surprised Maleficent hasn't showed up with a tie-in for the movie this this coming. Uh, yeah, year, well, so. uh, her quote is a little higher. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah, right. Well, yeah, Angelina Jolie gets a little more. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But they have this nice flexibility where none of the actresses are the same. Like, no. all the characters look different in Once Upon a Time than they do in the movies. So they actually have different actors and actresses playing right. the people. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Even even when it's the same person, like a real real actor or something. You, you mean Endel Mendoza's not going to be singing? I don't know. Probably. Let it go? No, no. no that, doubtful. No. Um, also, have either of you guys seen Godzilla yet? No. No. Is it on your watch list? Because I'm telling yes. you, it's worth watching. I really, I, I love Godzilla as a kid, you know, kaiju movies, all that fun, rubber suits. And the, um, and the last few Godzilla movies, the ones that come out like once every 10 years, it feels like it's a Godzilla movie, have all been pretty bad. This was really, I thought, very fun. I really liked it. Um, they did a good job with Godzilla. He stayed true to his character. Not that there's a lot of depth <laughs> to Godzilla, but he, he really was the kind of Godzilla he's meant to be. Um, I liked it a lot. So if you're a Godzilla at all fan, uh, whether a childhood fan of Godzilla or a more hardcore Godzilla fan, I think this is a, uh, mm-hmm. a quality film. Mm-hmm. So, I want a piece of trivia. Yeah, yeah, sure. Godzilla over the weekend made more money than every other movie on every other movie screen in America. Wow. Not a surprise. No. Godzilla. You know what? I was, I was trying to come up with a bonus question for a quiz for one of my classes, and I thought, oh, here's a good one. How many movies below number one do you have to add up to to make the same amount of money that number one made? And uh, I had to go online. I had to go to Box Office Mojo and go all the way down to the bottom where 20 feet from stardom uh, made $550 somewhere in Topeka. Well, um, I'm excited to see Add that. It all up that means there. they'll make a sequel, which is great because um, yes, they've it's, already started talking. It's about worthy that. of a sequel. So, Garrett, we're almost done with achievements here, but I wanted to ask you. Um, we have some uh, patrons over at Patreon. Who are I, folks I, who, I thought we would ask him what What do you watch, G- Garrett? Oh yes. 
Oh, uh, well, first of all, to touch upon, um, when I was in England, I also bumped into Lee Ehrenberg, the see? actor who's he's he's on uh, Once Upon a Time. So nice, um, nice. See? Look at this. And he he went to UCLA theater department, same as me back in the day. Oh, cool. so, awesome. So yeah. one more one degree of separation from Once Upon a Time. Now, this is excellent, Garrett. Yeah. There you go. Keep coming. Keep coming. <laughs> yes. Um, so what do I watch right now? Um, you know what's funny? I I I actually. <laughs> Uh, you remember Farscape, right? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I was very averse to watching that when it came out because I thought that a Jim Hunt, a Jim Henson created Muppet would be stupid <laughs> to have, to watch on a sci-fi show. So I didn't watch it until really recently did I mm. binge watch every single episode um, because I was going to be emceeing some panels with uh, – with Claudia Black and Ben Browder in Germany last year. So yeah. I, I really tried to make sure that I, you know, knew. I, I was like, you know what? I'll watch one episode just so I know what's you going on. You sucked in. And I ended up, oh my God, did it That's suck me good in. Because stuff. the thing is, it really, it's a fabulous show because they allowed everyone to have, you know, humorous moments. They really, yeah. they, they have some genuine, awesome comedic moments in there. Yep. Whereas in Voyager, that's something that I yearned for so much. I kept mm. trying to push the writers to allow the human characters to have some, some humor. Um, yeah. But they seem to only let the holographic doctor and Neelix have any type of humor and every, and everyone else was destined to be kind of, you know, not mm. funny in any way, super, shape or form. So, That's a good point. You kind of yeah. felt like they were all Jedi Knights in, in, in Voyager, right? The humans were, they were kind of very stoic. Exactly. Yeah. And it just, to me, I thought that was so wrong because if yeah. you watch the original series, you know, we, you kind of look forward to those light moments between Kirk and Spock and Bones. Yeah. And, and, and that, that, part that, of the sort whole of that, thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. the comedic levity really sort of balanced out the, the, the heavy-handed drama, which, you know, every episode the ship's going to you know, explode or whatever. Right. So um, I, I always felt that that's something that I love to see, and especially in the Trek films. Mm-hmm. You know, anytime you saw any type of um, – comedic moment with either Kirk or Spock, it really helped move everything along. You know, yeah. it helped balance everything. And I, I, sure. I pushed so hard for that on Voyager and and it was just no can do, no, you know, which I thought was wrong on the part of the writers and producers. I thought they could have really uh, had that ba- extra balance in there, you know. So, mm-hmm. yeah, but instead they had stupid things like um, – uh, Oh yeah, so pa- there's at the end of one episode, Paris looks at Tuvok. He goes, he goes, you know what, Tuvok? You're a real freakosaurus. That was his line. <laughs> and I thought, what? Wow, that's like slightly better. No, that's far worse than like a snake through a tube. Like a snake <laughs> through a tube is classic. You know? That is. But it is Tuvok, classic. you're a freakosaurus. I was like, oh, oh. gosh. And then all the right, I, at, the, at the table reading, were they all looking at you going, Garrett, look, we did it. <laughs> There's a joke. No, no. no. Actually, no we never were. had table readings. We never had table readings. Really? We sort of, yeah, we were, oh. we were running on this crazy schedule, and there was oh. no time to rehearse. Nothing. But um, but yeah, but the, you know, and it was sad because every single member of Voyager was hilarious in their own right. So I often said, if someone was recording us in between takes uh-huh. on the bridge, whatever, sure. that could be edited into the number one sitcom in America by <laughs> far. Because there is, oh my gosh, Robbie McNeil, is, who plays Paris, is hilarious yeah, if you allow him to be, you know, uh-huh. and don't put these stupid lines like you're a freakosaurus on there. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and even up to, K, you know, so everyone across the board, Robert Beltran, Robert Picardo, all the Roberts, Robert Duncan McNeil, <laughs> um, it's very interesting. These three Roberts, they're all Scorpios. I don't know what that means, but anyway. Uh, but even uh, even Kate Mulgrew was absolutely hilarious, you know. Wow. But they didn't. Listen, you didn't see that. I don't you buy saw it. Kate. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't I know. Buy it. I know. It's the Iron Lady. It. Hilarious. I don't buy it. <laughs> I'm telling you, that woman has got a really hilarious uh, streak in her that awesome. may border on r-rated at times <laughs> but still it's great stuff you know so like i said it should have been filmed uh when we were not on camera and that would have been awesome it would have been so. awesome to have a reality series behind the voyage there's your title right Ooh. there it itself. Ship it. look at that you got it <laughs> <laughs> that was that would, that would have been awesome see you it was way ahead of the whole reality series thing though that's that right. been way too yeah. ahead of time. that's Definitely. awesome cool so um Garrett, we do have a couple questions yes, for you though yes. from our now listeners. Now the questions here. So, yes. so uh, first of all, they want one of them wanted to know. Phil wanted to know how you got involved with the Geek Nation tour thing coming up this summer at Gen Con. Yeah, uh, you know Terrace who runs that. I, yeah. I bumped into him at, at a at a convention. Basically, mm-hmm. he had a booth there, and we were just talking. And and then um, 
he just mentioned, oh, would it be possible if you came along with us and <laughs> played some games with everybody? And I, and I said, he doesn't yeah, <laughs> like, where, what, what's, when's this, where are you guys going? He goes, Gen Con. I said, oh, geez, I haven't been to Gen Con in decades. I mean, it literally, the last time I was there, they were still in Wisconsin. Oh, wow. It has been a while. Yeah, they weren't, yeah. they weren't, they weren't even in Indianapolis. Right. So that gives you an indication of how long ago that was. Yeah. So, um, and you know, like I said, I mean, I, when I was in, when I was younger, I did game. So it was something that did attract me and I thought, Oh, why not? I'll, I'll give it a shot. So great. Uh, I, think, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I do. Yeah, okay. I think so too. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I look forward to it as well. And then uh, Mark wanted to ask, now this might be tricky for you because you haven't gamed in a while, but mm -hmm. his question is, okay, you're stranded in the Delta Quadrant, mm -hmm. and you can only bring two games with you, a board game and a card game. What would you choose and why? Oh, my gosh. Uh, Monopoly, because everybody loves it. And then uh, card game would be Uno. Uno. All right, there you go. <laughs> Don't he's judge staying. him, people. He's Don't only now coming me. back into the fold. Right, he's just getting back in. He's toes in the water. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's like, I just named two things that were basically grade school, right? I mean, no, well, you know, <laughs> some, hey, I still okay. like Uno. Look, there are gamers out there who will defend Monopoly to their death. So, you know, it's, okay, it's, it's a quality product. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're, you're not too far gone. 50 million copies can't be wrong. You know, <laughs> 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 so good. The sad truth. All right. I think that is achievements. Is that achievements? I do believe that is achievement. Oh, it's still wrong. <laughs> You're listening to the D6 Generation. More the game. Hey, now it's time to talk about our friends at Battlefoam. Battlefoam.com yeah, you know, I am loving my Battle Foam XL bag that I use for my descent stuff with a cool. Man, that sees so much action. It does with a cool mole siding, Craig. Have you seen this stuff? Mole, 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 mole. I know. I think that's how you pronounce that. No, no, uh, I don't know. I it's got good to it's me. got this stitching stuff here. What happens is there's now attachments for your bag. It looks which, like you're going in a battle it, for real. Which you, right, and you can attach these little pouches, different things, and. The pouch I have on there is the iPad pouch, which I actually don't use for my iPad. I actually use it for the really, really large bits of descent terrain in there. Mm -hmm. um, I have a uh, pouch on the side that hold all my dice. So if I want to quickly piece of, grab some dice out of my bag without having to go in, unzip it, get inside of it, all right there for me. Great stuff. Plus, it holds my entire descent collection, including all descent one, all my descent one models, plus all my descent two models, plus all the expansions because I'm obsessed with this game and I own all the stuff. So it is just a great way to get things around. Uh, Craig, what are the new hotness things coming from Battlefield? I see lots of trays for the Star Wars. Uh, are those for Star Wars? Javelin attack speeder? That's well, that uh, Warhammer 4. That's uh, that's uh, uh, Horus Heresy stuff. Yeah, exactly. What I'm seeing. Well, they have or that. A, lot of, a lot of cool Horus Heresy stuff from... Um, uh, from Forge World, yeah. and of course the mole stuff is huge, and those big giant Death Dread killer cans. Yeah. So I mean, really, you've got you've got all kinds of options when you go over to um to Battle Foam, and you've got the you've got different options for the ships. You've got yep, you've got all kinds of cool the, the Corillian Corvette. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got pre-made trays. You've got your your standard cuts. You've got your custom trays that you can design yourself. Not only that, you've got all kinds of options for the different bags. Everything from the you can shoot a bullet and it won't go through this mm -hmm. black label all the way to the new D-Box, the standard loadout uh, for which is going to cost you really, really a bare minimum for Battle Foam because I believe it's a cardboard box with some nice latching and, and, and handle. Really? So really, everything for every possible budget at Battle Foam. Yeah, and they're always innovating, too. If you want to see what I mean by this, go check out the new Privateer Press tournament bag. Yeah, Ooh. that thing is hot. Anyway, check them all over at BattleFoam.com. Battle Foam. And now, what's in the news? Brought to you by all of our fantastic patrons over at Patreon. Their support helps make this show possible. Head on over to the d 6 generationcom and click on the Patreon logo for more information. And see Craig and I in a video. Yes, and see Wakelin and Craig in a video. And now, well, the news up first. War Machine Tactics Beta is now in the hands of backers via Steam. I believe Wakelin has played it. Oh yeah, baby! 
He played against uh, who'd you play against Wakeland? I played Shifty. He kicked my butt. Uh, yeah, so Wakeland and Shifty played it. Now in the beta, apparently right now it's just multiplayer, so two versus one versus one in a two-player game, and available as two fixed forces: Kador versus Signar, Sorsha versus Striker. It's basically the old starter box plus a unit, uh, a little bit extra. So it's pretty cool though. You really get a good feel for the game is. Still working on the UI, but it's definitely a lot of fun. Graphics look great. Wakeland is mostly impressed. Mostly. Pretty awesome. All right. It's on the right track, so we'll see what happens with that. Keep an eye on that. If you're a War Machine fan, I think you'll enjoy this game. Uh, see other news? Pathfinder Class Decks. That's right. This is a series of Class Decks. They're launching August 14th. <laughs> Gen Con <laughs> uh, coming out. Uh, these Class Decks will be playable uh, with the original Plas- Pathfinder Adventure card game co-op thing or the upcoming Skull and Shackles uh, Pathfinder box set. The class decks will include the Bard, Cleric, Fighter, Ranger, Rogue, Sorcerer, and Wizard. Each class deck will have everything you need to play that class. Sounds pretty cool if you want to get all decked out in your bardiness. Uh, Let's see, speaking of dungeon crawling, uh, Dungeon Lords Anniversary Edition is well on its way to delivery via Kickstarter. The Anniversary Edition, I guess it's been a while since the original Dungeon Lords games out, comes with the, there's various options on there, actually. If you just want to get the new stuff, you can get that. If you don't have the game yet, but of course you can get the base game. There's even a really fancy wood engraved box for those Dungeon Lords fan out there, but also includes the Festival Seasons expansion, plus lots of bling for the game, including 30 metal coins, food stickers to kick up the, your wooden stuff, dungeon setup cards, which give you some pre-configured dungeons, that'll variety of the game. Minions Bearing Gifts expansion. Uh, great options if you already own the game or you want to get into it. If you're a Dungeon Lords fan or always wanted to be, check it on out at uh, Kickstarter over there. Also uh, in the news, uh, Wakeland likes a game of chess now and then. Oh, yeah, I do. How about this? Chess 2, the sequel. That's right. Uh, folks have been working hard on a new version of chess. Uh, I guess it's just expanding the idea. And the, the premise here is a less memorization and more on positional play. And the way they're going to do this is adding six new armies. So it makes it tactically challenging to just memorize every possible opening move with six different factions, i.e. six different pieces, combinations that work well. Uh, also, they've added an interesting win condition. In addition to checkmate, you also have crossing the midline with your king. So you can win either by checkmating your opponent or by getting your king across the middle of the table, which should reward aggressive play and remove stalemate options. What's really interesting about this is if you do not feel like buying or converting your own home chess set, you can get the iPad and Steam versions very soon, like within days of this broadcast. Uh, there are also free print-and-play rules as well over at SerlinGames.com. So if you want to just upgrade a regular chess set to this new version, you can try it out as well. So check on out, check that out. By the time you hear this, it should be live. Chess 2, if you're a chess fan, this might be worth a look. And speaking of new releases, how about Civilization Revolution 2? Uh, long-time fans of the Civilization series will remember Civilization Revolution, which is sort of a simplified version of Civ that came to consoles as well as portable devices. The console version was really, really well received. The portable device version was pretty good, but this new version of Civ 2 for iOS and Android will feature 3D renderings instead of the 2D sort of flat version that was on the original portable version. Also, some new units, including aircraft carriers, jet fighters, and spec ops, as well as new tech, including lasers, modern medicine, info technology, new buildings, wonders, scenario challenges, and more. So if you're into Civ Rev, you want to check that out. Uh, but that's not our app pick of the week. Uh, what's our app pick of the episode, Wakeland? Uh, yeah, let me get to the microphone here. <clears throat> hey, everybody. So my app of the app, as we say, I got a new title for this segment, app of the app. What do you think? Uh, pretty good, Wakeland. Thanks. Yeah, I thought you'd like it. Anyway, app of the app. Uh, this one is World of Tanks. Now, those who have played World of Tanks, a uh, great uh, free-to-play PC game, as well as it's now on the Xbox 360. Uh, this game basically is sort of a large-scale tank battle game. You basically hop into a tank and poof, uh, historical tanks from World War II era. So you've got the Russians, the Germans, and the Americans. You hop in this game and just blow up tanks. It's a lot of fun. As you progress, you level up your tank. You get access to different tanks of the era. So you go from lowly little small tanks all the way up to really heavy tanks, like Tiger tanks and other cool stuff. But now World of Tanks comes to iOS. It's really a cool imitation. It's not some, you know, little tacked-on title World of Tanks, but now it's a 2D top-down view. No, it's a full 3D multiplayer, I believe it's 8-on-8 tank paddle game where you actually get in there, control the turret, 3D view, drive it around feels very much like the PC experience. If you are a tank commander treadhead like myself, and you'd like to play it on your phone while you're, you know, waiting for the line in the groceries or whatever, now you can with World of Tanks on your iPhone. Check it out. And that's my pick for App of the Week. And that's 
What's in the news? Hey, and now it's time to talk about our friends from Conquistador Games. Conquistador Games. Now, you know, everybody is a football fan right now because the World That's Cup right. is going on. Who isn't? Everyone is. But uh, team... Even I am a football fan now. Yeah, yeah. Who are you supporting, Craig, right now? Uh, I was supporting uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina because yeah. of their goalie who launched the guy from Ghana uh, off, off the uh, off the pitch or nice. whatever they want to call it Field? because the guy was acting like he was hurt again. <laughs> that was the best moment in <laughs> sports awesome. I've ever seen. That is awesome. Now, a- if you want to emulate football on your own gaming table, you can do that. Now, normally I'd play the Vuvuzela sound here, but uh, as we know... Uh, I don't even remember what it sounds in, like. In, They've outlawed the Vuvuzela this year. They, really? They, yes, they have. Due, due to annoying, uh, which, you know, I, I gotta agree with on this. I get actually. it. I get but it. Anyway, so, but let's say you want to have the fun of football in your own home and, and you know, that way you can allow Vuvuzelas or not allow them. It's, it's completely That's up to true. You. It's up to you. Um, you could make it a death penalty to use a Vuvuzela. You can, what you want to do is head on over to CQ Games, head on to Kickstarter and search for football. Or Conquistador Games, you'll find this great Kickstarter there that's going on. Football right strategy. Now. Football strategy. A really, really cool idea where you've got their football board game there, but uh, your, your soccer players are actually cards with all their stats right on them. Based on real people. Based on real people. And from, see, from year to year, you'll be able to change your decks of cards and upgrade your players to keep the game in sync with actual players in the professional sports of, of football. Which is pretty exciting. Football. So if you're really a hardcore strategy. soccer fan, this is the game for you. Get over to Kickstarter, find CQ Games, or find Football, F U T B O L, and mm. you will find a Kickstarter that I think you're going to really enjoy checking out. That's okay. friends at Conquistador Games. Conquistador Games. In a world where board gaming was king, In a time when Kickstarter ruled the web, when every day brought more and more games, now, more than ever, two men, and a revolving third chair, and a girl, a total fangirl, brought a shining light into the darkness so that all mankind would know what to buy. They are the D6 Generation. Hey, welcome back. And now we cannot let Garrett escape this episode without asking him lots of exciting questions. Well, about himself. Let's be honest. About about Garrett. Yes. So, um, Garrett, up first, we we always ask all our guests this question. And you've already kind of hinted at the answer here in Achievements, but we'll ask you anyway. Are you now or have you ever been a gamer? Uh, Yes. Back in the day, probably seventh grade to senior year uh, in high school, I did play Dungeons and Dragons. So I would say that was my gaming time. Nice. Was that now one contiguous campaign during that time period or did you play? Multiple <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, multiple. <laughs> All right, fair no. enough. <laughs> that would be a long campaign, my lord. Yeah, would. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Some of us have been in games that long. I was going to say, we've heard of worse. Or at least felt like it. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> nice. Great. Well, so there you go. And um, so... um. Having acted in a sci-fi series yourself, um, are you also a sci-fi fan? Yes. Um, I have always been a sci-fi fan. I mean, I saw my first sci-fi, my entry point into sci-fi was the uh, uh, 1977 uh, original Star Wars film. I saw that at the theater, so. Nice. That's awesome. So you saw it when it came out in the theater? Like it, the, Yes. Yes, I was like old enough eight. To, yes, very good. So, so, so now that brings up a question that we were – that we were going to skirt around, but we might as well just throw it wide open now. Just th- open can, can you be part of the Star Trek legacy and still like Star Wars? Of course. Clearly. That's what I was saying. <laughs> That's what course. I was saying. I, I say, I'd say to people, I say, I like Star Wars and Star Trek equally. I mean, in different, in different ways, but, but in terms of my enthusiasm for them, I, mm-hmm. I watch them just as, as enthusiastically, either Star Wars or Star Trek. Well, let me ask so. you this, Gary, cause, cause there's a perceived rivalry sometimes between the, is it real? Cause obviously you're at Star Trek conventions all the time doing this kind of thing. Is that, is that just a lot of hooey and everybody gets along or is there a real, is something going on there? Um, I think there, for some people, yeah, it's definitely mm-hmm. something going on, but what they have to realize is that, um, 
you know, it's all sci-fi. <laughs> so yeah, it's I, all good. I, right. I think, yeah, it's all, and it's all good. And and people should stop, you know, this this silly banter back and forth about, you know, oh, this is our this is our what we cheer for, and then this is what we watch, and what you watch is stupid, and blah blah blah, blah you know, whatever. You've got Jar Jar, whatever. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't. That is buy a good point, that. though. Yeah, but you know? but Star Trek has Spock's brain, so you you really both sides. Or have you issues. have, or hey, you've got Ferengi heads, right? You know? I mean, right. They're randomly, horribly looking, stupid things too. So <laughs> right. I mean, you could, fair enough. You could go back. You can go back and forth, tit for tat, all day you can. long if you, you can. want yeah. to. Let's know? be honest. Yeah. But let's 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 just all just. Play a lot, play nicely, and get along. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know. There you go. So, so, so if we're all going to like all sci-fi or you know wide variety of genres, which we should, mm-hmm. uh, what are some of your favorite franchises beyond Star Wars and Star Trek? Um, original BSG, so Ooh, nice. original yeah. Battlestar Galactica, yeah. um, yeah. new BSG, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say uh, back in the day, Gil Gerard as uh, Buck Rogers. Uh, yeah, that that floated my boat for sure. Saw so mm-hmm. all those episodes, um, and. Um, you know what? There was one thing from the fantasy side. There was a show, a TV show called The Heart, uh, about a guy that was a heart bowman. Yes, he had a bow that shot yes. like energy arrows, yes. right? So, yes. Just, but no one's ever heard of that show. It was awesome. Me because it said to be continued. It yes. was awesome. <laughs> and it never showed the second half. <laughs> I remember that. It was like, and, oh. and I kept, oh my gosh, I, I probably read TV Guide. <laughs> literally, I read TV Guide for 12 years straight. Every week going, where is it? Where is the like, second episode? I remember, I mean, that. That, I remember oh. that show too. I'm like, I've always so much trying to bring that up. Like, remember that guy with the bow and shot energy? Yeah, like, what are you talking about? The bow had to accept you. Yes. There were orcs in there. Yes. And there were goblins. Oh, man, I totally remember that so show. so awesome. It was, it was great. so great. <laughs> and then it never showed the... You know what? I would like to find the executive producers and slap them for making me <laughs> exactly. watch, I mean, for making me read TV Guide, looking, scanning right. every week for years. Yeah, you know? the, I mean, years. Those three little right. words, man. This yeah, makes to, to be, be continued. continued. It makes the yeah, Firefly yeah. cancellation look light. <laughs> we got like one, yes. one episode. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. I mean, Firefly people have nothing to complain about for the, the Hart Bowman people that left it to us. Gosh. Exactly. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, that was a oh, nice reference. That was that was good. That was good. Now, um, Garrett, do you get a lot of t- chance to go to the movies, like to see some? of We've had some 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 big st- uh, sci fi movies coming out recently. Has, has there been anything that kind of caught your eye? Uh, well, you know, I'll tell you, I don't. I didn't like the second JJ entry into. Oh, uh, okay. That that, that was later down on my bullets, but uh, let me, yeah. let's go over there right now. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. Two thousand. Uh, the first one was awesome. I thought I, okay. I was I was happy with that I was not. I was not like some fans flipping out about the destruction of of Vulcan, the home yeah. planet. Uh-huh. I, that didn't bother me. I, I said okay, way, they know. can the timeline. But yeah. I like the pacing. And the feel of that movie, I thought that was perfectly paced and fast scene balanced by a slow yep. scene. Fast, slow, fast, slow. Whereas with the newest one, Star Trek Into Darkness, it was mm-hmm. just action, 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 nonstop. Yep. And then – and really cliche. They took old storylines. you know. Yeah. You, uh, they flipped things around and it was just – it was blah. Yeah. It was uh, – uh, the, the casting of, of Benedict Cumberbatch as Khan, please, what are you doing? Why are you casting this pasty, skinny British actor as Khan? That doesn't work at all for me, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then in J.J. World, what a fool. I mean, I kept thinking, I kept thinking, you already know J.J. Abrams from Lost, you know of the per- perfect actor to play uh, Khan. Khan is actually not Latino like Ricardo Montalban, but he's Sikh. <laughs> Yeah. His background is Sikh, Sikh, which is from East India, you know. Yes, so that would have been cool. You're right. You've got that somebody. Totally cool. Yeah, you've got the, the actor who played Saeed on Lost. Oh, that would have been yes, awesome. Yes, would have been awesome. Perfect. You're right. right? Look at look at how barrel chested that guy looks. Yeah. He, he, he would have been fine. He would have been yeah. fabulous. I would have believed him killing sixty five Klingons in that one scene. Right. <laughs> right. And in real life, if that happened, the, the first Klingon would have walked up to Benedict Cumberbatch, picked him up, <laughs> and then just basically body slammed him and broken him in half in, in one move. I know? like how there's been... Klingons in your real life. That's awesome. <laughs> that. <laughs> you know, yeah. In real life, the real Klingons would have killed him. I was gonna but say, you're right. I'm with you. Klingons. Take him out. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, and don't so... email us, folks. We've got an expert on the show right now. Expert. knows Klingon. Right. He's fought Klingon himself. Klingon. I took uh, I took a selfie of myself sitting in the audience of Star Trek Into Darkness and I tweeted saying, I uh, can't wait for the movie to begin. 
And then after the movie, <laughs> after watching the film, I deleted the tweet. Oh, <laughs> man. I just, I was like, no. I don't want to be this known as someone excited ridiculous. for this film. Ouch. Yeah, yeah, wow. And I said, S- Star Trek Into Darkness, the acronym, stands for Star Trek Imitating Die Hard. Okay. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. on top of that, I yeah. further stomped on it a little further. I, I said, um, oh, and the funny thing was Will Wheaton loved the second one. I thought, what? <laughs> the king of all geeks loves <laughs> Star Trek Into Darkness? How can that be? I don't know. Uh, well, sometimes you've got the Emperor's New Clothes thing going on. Well, I don't. I mean, it was yeah. pretty. It was beautiful to watch, but it wasn't science fiction. I, I then went on to tweet that, uh, sorry, Man of Steel was more of a Star Trek, uh, was more of a sci-fi film uh, oh, than wow. uh, Star Trek. Uh oh, being his bonnet the, right there. The intro was the elements, for sure. The, yeah. All the elements on Man of Steel of showing uh, on on Krypton, um, the the home world that they, they they created there for the audience was was fabulous with that sort of retro almost almost um steampunkish kind of technology yeah, where right. they had the, you know the the molded metal as 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 the view, the view screen and all that stuff i thought that was amazing it was brilliant yeah. um i really liked it i liked the armor in there that that they used yeah the, that was the cool the costume yeah, that was awesome. everything was super freaking cool about <laughs> that man of steel you know watching that so both, I both, that. ironically i don't know if you noticed I, I i felt that both movies into darkness and man of steel ended the same which was the needless destruction of a city right, it was just right. Like, we're just going to destroy a city now for no apparent reason right. it, no yeah reason. that was my main <laughs> problem with the with into darkness was that you know hundreds of thousands of people died when that ship crashed well, the in the part, middle of the both, city and, and it never totally. got any comment and both man of oh, steel yeah. and and to darkness at the end the, the cities are ruined probably thousands of people are dead and there's like hey we did it Woo-hoo, no worries you know it's like <laughs> right you know? yep. yeah who cares yeah. so yeah. That's sort of now true. that's interesting because i was i was curious garrett about how you would have feel about the reboot with the whole new cast and the re rebooting the entire universe basically that wasn't what bothered you you actually really had sort of technical legitimate well, yeah. uh anal- analytical issues with that second movie Right, right, I did. But the first movie was amazing. Well, first of all, it was not amazing because J.J. did not, number one, he said, he said, anybody who's ever worked on Star Trek before, other than Letter Nimoy, is not allowed to work on my film. <laughs> I don't care if you're a makeup artist, wardrobe, actor, oh. whatever, cameraman, if you worked on any prior incarnation of Star Trek, you're not allowed to be on mine, wow. which I thought was really exclusive. And when And when he had the screening, for uh for for the his first film the hollywood premiere he invited none of us patrick wow. stewart wasn't invited janeway i mean kate mulgrew nobody was invited to that to that uh huh. premiere wow. which i thought was horrible i remember i remember watching something on you know uh extra or something on tv and they said they showed the actor there's an african-american actor who was a pretty boy shamar something whatever his name is yeah. they showed him at the screening i'm like what is shamar pretty boy doing <laughs> at that screening and not you know it's in Kim. What the hell? You know, wow. WTH. WTF. <laughs> WTF. I, mean, right. I, mean, I was so mad. Yeah. And uh, uh, luckily, Gene Roddenberry's son, Rod Roddenberry, actually invited everybody, all the actors, all the all the camera people, all the below the line, above the line, to a screening at Paramount Studios uh, before the movie came out. So that's where I first saw it. Um, and I'll tell you, I was so nervous because before that movie began, I was like, oh, my gosh, please be good. Please be yeah. good. Don't be crap. You know, this right. is part of my, my legacy, too. Yep, yep. And I remember the first scene, you, you see that the camera, the camera kind of goes across the hull of the, uh, of the, of the uh, Starfleet ship uh, and you hear the familiar pinging sound, you know, and then you, you actually you're drawn in and you're immediately in this huge firefight with this this advanced Romulan ship that comes out of nowhere and we're just sitting there going what and I just remember the destruction scene being so crazy and then you have that one shot where the the crew member gets sucked down to, out into space mm-hmm. and right. it's totally quiet right yeah you go from screaming yelling people all hell breaking loose to whoosh, just quiet yeah. and that use of just silence by by JJ it was just so and and also the soundtrack I mean the uh, the soundtrack was amazing the music composed uh, the the music composer really did a, a fabulous fabulous job mm. and um I, I just thought overall that that film just it just it, it sucked me in and i loved it and i loved seeing i love seeing the prequel in terms of um the the young co- the young kirk and the young mm. young spock their lives you know you don't really see that portrayal that often so that was really nice to see that um and so i was super super excited so excited that i ended up going 
I, I saw the screening, and then right after that, I flew to Cape Canaveral to see one of the final space shuttle launches. I got invited yeah. to that, which oh, very was very cool. cool. Very nice. Yeah, very um, cool. And then, lo and behold, I'm at Cape Canaveral, and they've got an IMAX stadium. And guess what's playing? <laughs> Star Trek. So I go to see it again a second time. And I remember walking up to buy tickets. There would be other fan. There would be other people in front of me. As they turned around, they noticed they they, they, they saw me. They oh, well, what are you doing here? I said, well, you know, I like to watch movies too. And um, <laughs> so then got by same thing. Walking into the movie theater, buying some popcorn, and people in front are just flipping out, and people behind. <laughs> and then I, I I end up sitting a, sitting with some of the fans from the from from getting the popcorn and and um but what happened was after i saw it the second time i bumped into some other people at the launch who said they'd never seen the movie and i said well, okay well we got to go see it <laughs> so i met them i met them two days later in orlando to see it at imax there so i saw it three <laughs> times within four days right wow. i continued to keep seeing it in every city i went to and, <laughs> wow. and then by that point i started buying tickets for people behind me in line <laughs> in front of me you know i was doing all this so you did and your even bit though, keep, you know yes. jj here here's jj going you're not allowed to my premiere and here i am buying paying out of my own pocket <laughs> yeah, for myself yeah, yeah. people in front of me behind <laughs> and then oh i even went to amsterdam i was in amsterdam and i said you know what i gotta go see it again so i find out the imax theater in netherlands is 45 minutes outside the city i take public transportation on a train to get to the imax in netherlands right <laughs> that's Same, dedication even the dutch yeah and the dutch fans are like oh what are you doing here oh my god just, you know, I, I like to watch the movie. and so uh so in total i saw that damn film 11 times at the theater <laughs> wow right and oh, so then right. the Saturn Awards comes around, and J.J. Abrams is accepting a special award at the Saturn Awards. And a buddy of mine was was sponsoring the after party. So I just sort of propped myself very close to the entrance and waited for J.J. And J.J. shows up, and I walk up to him, and I said, hey, J.J. And in this really just sour voice, I go, I said, thanks so much for the premiere invite, buddy. <laughs> and, then he, and he kind of goes, uh, <laughs> sorry. And he looks down at the ground. I go, but that's okay, because I ended up seeing your movie 11 times and plus i paid for other people in line too so i've sort of already added to your bottom dollar there and he was like what he just looks at me like you saw it how many times so you know there you go there you go <laughs> yep that's that's Locked, nice. well, so the first forever. one so you that's did, okay so I'm that's, guessing, all good. Though, that's all gold man the second one you saw once good. i assume one time into the darkness one time right yep that was yeah it. yeah yeah into yeah. darkness was one time one time that was yeah. That was done. yeah so, <laughs> so and yeah. you know what i think jj had star uh, star wars on the brain when he was yeah he's he already was in star wars mode now right so right so but he go. was in star wars mode when he was directing the second uh, into darkness i feel yeah. he was already yeah. there i do yeah but it just even if you look at the if you look at some of the it's interesting because if you look at starfleet headquarters in, in into darkness everybody walking around their their uniforms they, just, uh -huh. they look like Empire uniforms from the original <laughs> Star Wars, you know? It's like they're all in that dark kind of grayish looking Empire-like looking uniforms. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I thought just, the giveaway was when that little boxy droid just went around through the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> That's, right. That's true. Yeah, okay. That You're right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let's keep things moving. Uh, let's talk more about Garrett. Yes. Garrett, why don't you – can you tell us a little bit about – so uh, you you um you you lived all over America when you were younger. Uh, yeah. Settled down in Memphis, I believe. Yes, I was born in uh, Riverside, California. Moved to Indiana, Indiana for two years, then Bermuda for six years, then Memphis, Tennessee for eight years, and back to California uh, for college. Uh, well, I've got I've got to guess Bermuda to Memphis is a bit of a downgrade. Uh, yeah, it was interesting. I went to a British, a British private school in, in, uh, Bermuda. So when I got to Memphis, I had a British accent. I was used to wearing <laughs> uniforms, you know, uh, as a school, a British private school boy. And I go to a private school in Memphis, which uh, you, you could wear jeans and you could uh, wear anything you wanted to class. And I thought, how come you're talking so funny? I know. <laughs> and they were like, where are you from? I said, well, I'm, I'm from Bermuda actually. And I, I, I um I, I went to school there, British private school, and so now I'm here in Memphis. And they were like, "Oh my gosh, what are you?" Uh, <laughs> they didn't know what the heck, you know. They could get, they couldn't, they couldn't wrap their minds around it, you know. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah, but uh, Memphis was an interesting. Memphis actually really kind of shaped my my future in that when I got to Hollywood or when I started my career as an actor, um, my primary drive was not fame and fortune my mm -hmm. primary drive was to portray a non-stereotypical character uh -huh. so that 
Um, maybe some kid, some Asian kid living in the South, uh, in Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, uh-huh. anywhere in the deep South, would avoid persecution like I did. I mean, uh-huh. I on a daily basis, I, I got called names, and I'm, yeah. here I am going to a, a Christian high, a Christian private school, and and there are people that are acting very unChristian like, you know, mm. by calling me names. I mean, racial epithets are the worst. You can call someone fatty, four eyes. Well, okay, four eyes can get contact lenses yeah. or LASIK. Fatty can go to the gym and work out, but when you call somebody a racial name there ain't nothing you can do to change who you are ethnic ethically so it's the worst type of bullying possible um and i i've often said to people i said bullying should be a felony you should be you should be literally you should be expelled from school for for Mm. bullying it should be uh, the hardest possible fine possible because you can't you know, you're too young to deal with it. Your mind cannot right. yep. deal with bullying. Yep. You know, it's ridiculous. You well, want to that's... stop Columbine and all these damn shootings? You stop the bullying. You make bullying such a crime that nobody bullies anymore, and nobody will get shot and killed. That's the bottom line. So, and that that's actually happening in a lot of schools and a lot of states. I know New Hampshire, where I teach, it's uh, we are going to bullying um, seminars on a regular basis now, and there's a lot of new laws on the books because of a lot of the cyberbullying. That is resulting in suicides that are more publicized than uh, than I think a lot of the things that have happened in the past. I don't think it's more prevalent now. I just think it's more obvious because so many of these kids are living, you know, online, and yeah. so because of those the 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 very public suicides and 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 these cases that are making national news now, a lot of states are actually addressing it. I don't think anybody's gone quite to the felony extent yet, but. Um, but it, there's a lot more um, – uh, people are taking it a lot more seriously. But I can see uh, on a personal level how, how that would affect uh, your yeah. outlook and, and drive you into a, um, into a career that's got a sort of an atypical goal now in your mind where you're, yeah. you, you've got a larger – you've got a, sort of a larger context that you're working within. Yeah. And it, you know, it actually, like I said, it it pushed me so hard that, that when I got Voyager, that was a godsend because that character was completely non-stereotypical. And they even asked me that the producers, they said, so, you know, do you have any concerns? I said, well, yeah. I said, I don't, I don't want you, Ensign Kim, I want him to be a Starfleet officer first and just secondary that he is of Asian background, you know? Mm -hmm. So don't, don't have Kim walking into the mess hall, go walking up to a replicator and ordering a, you know, a bowl of noodles, you know, or, (laughs) or, or or, or kimchi or some sushi, you know, like don't do that, you know, just, just, just be really, be cool about that. And I remember there was an episode where, uh, they had some of us go down uh, to a planet, sort of uh, not not on a, on a mission, but just sort of R and R. And so we got to wear like regular civ- civilian clothing. And they were having a they they sort of reused um, wardrobe pieces from Next Gen too. So there was a top a shirt that that Picard wore that co- kind of like overlapped, almost like a karate gi, you know, like a yeah. mm-hmm. something like Asian. I think uh, I top. remember that exact top. <laughs> yep. So they said to me, they said, okay, we got, we want you to okay this top. Are you okay with this? If you think this is too dead on or too, you know, you know, Asian, then we will uh-huh. give you an alternate top. And I looked at it and I said, well, where's this from? They go, oh, Picard word. I go, oh, that's fine. I'll wear it. <laughs> that's, cool. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That is just fine with me. You know, so I, I was like, I'll wear Picard's top. Awesome. But, no. Um, Back to the bullying, I was just it yeah. just came to my mind. Um, I think it was the seventies or maybe the seventies or the eighties when in New York, an individual by the name of Curtis Sliwa S L I W A. I don't know if I pronounced that right. He started the Guardian Angels. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. The Guardian Angels was sort of a, a volunteer group. They sort of patrolled subways and just made sure people didn't get messed up by criminals. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be interesting if you had a group of of people who were bullied? Back in the day, but then now as adults, they're, they're, you know, let's just say they're really, they've changed their whole, you know, physicality or maybe they've been working out and they're really huge. There should be like a brute squad or sort of a a bully squad that could help out people (laughs) that people could call. Did you see that? A bunch of guys that are now jocks (laughs) that were nerds back in the day showing up at a school and just grabbing the local jocks and throwing up, throwing them up against the blockers and saying, if you say one more thing, we will find you you and we will kick your ass ass you know sort of like fight fire with fire but that'd be kind of cool anyway sorry <laughs> segwaying okay and we're gonna take that segue back around now and yeah. uh you were mentioning how uh at the very beginning when you were hired in uh where you got when you got the part of ensign kim yeah. why don't we talk a little bit about how you got the part of ensign kim how long had you been um an actor when that when that um all transpired 
Uh, well, you know, that was my 32nd audition. So it was about a year and a half into my professional career. Mm-hmm. But I had been training as an actor and basically arguing with my parents and trying to explain why I wasn't going to med school for about four mm-hmm. to five years before mm-hmm. I even even got an agent. So um, so I wasn't a novice when I got on the Voyager. Uh-huh. I had already been doing theater for a long, long time and doing some pretty decent theater, you know, around around town. Um, and uh, so when I got vo- when I got the Voyager audition, um, it was a long audition process. Uh, I think I was next to the last person cast on that show. Oh, wow. mm-hmm. um, it was a two and a half month uh, and I went in probably – uh, six times, whereas, you know, Tim Russ, who played Tuvok, Roxanne Dawson, who played Torres, they had one audition and got it. Boom. Uh-huh, it was like right. one yeah. and done. And I just had to go back over and over again. Part of the reason because my resume was so short. I had nothing uh-huh. on there. They, they couldn't really – they were like, okay, should we should we give the keys to this new fighter jet, so to speak, you know, to this <laughs> this guy who hasn't even flown any, any flight hours at all, you know, right. blah blah blah. Yeah. So um, that was the the tough part, and they saw every Asian actor from he, from uh, across the globe. I remember, oh, I remember on my third or fourth, third audition, as I'm walking into the office, I see the guy that played short round in, 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 in <laughs> Indianapolis, Indiana, <laughs> Indiana Jones, right? So and I go, oh my god, I just remember. I I go, oh my god, it's short round or or data from Goonies, right? I said, oh my god, it's him. So he walked past me, and and uh, I I just remember feeling really, just like wow, you know, I just that's like that's like Asian actor royalty, you know, at the time. So you beat so, out short round. That's awesome. Yeah, I beat that's, short round out. There you yeah. go. Now, there were you, you go. at this point? Were you already a fan of Star Trek, or were you sort of? I mean, did you did you kind of? Uh, know what you might be getting into with that in terms of the, no, the epicness? I, you know, I, I saw the movies. I saw yeah. the movies. Uh, the original series was on rerun when I was in grade school, but yeah. having watched uh, 1977 Star Wars at the theaters right. and being into that, that the visual effects that that, that, that movie brought, yeah. 1966, 67 Star Trek television was nothing in comparison to 77 right. Star right. Wars. So it bored me. You know, I yeah. thought, oh, this is really hokey. So I never watched the original series except for it could be only because it was the only thing on. I would just uh-huh. sort of you know right. labor belabor through it. Didn't understand the, the the hidden message in every Star Trek episode, you know, at the time I was young, a kid. Um but uh as time went on, I wait, I've just lost my train of thought. What what was your initial question? Oh, was that, what, did you know going into uh oh, were, whether or not it was yeah, yeah. yeah. Was so no, I I'd, I'd seen all the f- films in, in the theater, but I didn't know any, much about the uh about the TV side of it, because the second for after the original series was Next Gen. Next Gen came on when I was in college, actually. Right. So, yeah. and I remember turning that that I, I, I was so excited. I was like, oh, "Ooh, this is great! They're doing a new, you know, they're doing a new Star Trek." And um, I I didn't see the pilot episode. I I tuned in about the midway through first season one, yeah. and I got an episode called Code of Honor. Um, Code of Honor has been agreed upon by uh, writers across uh, Star Trek writers and producers to be the worst written episode of Star Trek ever. Okay, yes. it's the one where they land on the planet of all African American people wearing turbans, and at the end, Tasha Yar has to duel this other turban African American woman in a cage, and it just with with Hialai or that game, you know, in the, uh-huh. you know, the, yes. yeah, yeah. the Hialai type looking uh, weapons. It was just horrible, and I remember it was bad because the, when they the first thing they do. The the away team gets down on the planet and the aliens uh, – one of the aliens comes up to Picard holding something like he's handing it to him. But, it, right. but Tasha Yar flips him – grabs his arm and flips him on the ground yeah. and um, – uh, Picard says, "I'm sorry, that's my security chief." And then um, <laughs> after he says that, the, the the guy, the aliens on the ground, looking up, going, "But, but it was a gift." And then, uh, uh, and then, oh, yeah, he, goes, he, he says it was a gift, and that's when Picard goes, "Oh, I'm sorry, that was my security chief." And then he looks at Dasha Yar and goes, "Your security chief is a woman." <laughs> like that, and I thought, "Oh my god, this is horrible." Yes. Well, I watched the whole damn thing, and I thought I, I wanted to throw my shoe at the TV screen. I said, "This is horrible." So I gave it another shot. About nine months later, I said, okay, I'm going to watch it again. I turn on the TV. It's a rerun of Code of Honor. <laughs> I, two times in a row. So then I turned it off. I, I came back in a year and a half after that. Okay, so we're talking about over almost three years after the first time I saw it. And it was again a rerun of Code of Honor. So I thought, you know what? 
this is God trying to tell me <laughs> yeah, something. Wasn't meant to be. Show. Yeah, it's not meant to be. You're not supposed to watch Next Generation. <laughs> and it's a good thing I didn't watch up with a good episode because I would have been hooked. I would have been like really, really, really this huge uh, Trek fan yeah. walking into that Voyager audition and being nervous as uh-huh. you know, as right. a chihuahua. Basically, yeah. I would have been shaking uh, nonstop and. Um, Thinking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is the show that's you know uh, it's taking over where Next Gen left off. Oh my gosh, oh my, you know I would have flipped that. So <laughs> yeah. um, it's kind of good that God made me watch the crappiest episode three times. This week. <laughs> Thank you, God. There yeah, you go. So, there you go. Yeah. There nice. you go. So you had no there idea you. about? Uh, did you know the about the, the, no, the fandom no and mystique idea. and all that stuff and that and, and all the no. cons and all that stuff? You know the yeah. funny thing was January we pre- January nineteen ninety five was the premiere on a Monday night of Voyager. Right. On that weekend, Saturday, I was asked to fill in for Kate Mulgrew at a convention in Minneapolis, Minnesota, yep. a Star Trek mm. convention there. I showed up there thinking that a Star Trek convention was a small, you know, a handful of maybe a, maybe a hundred fans in yeah. a like a living room type situation, you know, kind of a kind of MTV unplugged, you know, whatever, right. just, you know, really just kind of light, lighthearted. <laughs> well, I walk into a room of literally there were over 5,000 people. In right. The- and I, at the end of the room, they look like ants. That's how far back they were. And I thought, oh, I said, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe this was the fandom that was awaiting yeah, me. And I, right. I, it just blew me away. Um, so I went on after that to do 17 other conventions before anyone else on Voyager had done one. Wow. So being, I was the so youngest. you were hooked. Oh, yeah. I was the youngest crew member, but yet I was the Yoda of convention going. You know, I just looked like a wise old sage. And it was funny. All the other actors were coming up to me that were years, some of them decades older than me, asking me, so what's it like? Tell us about the conventions. And here I am, you know, like I, I was on the front lines, you know, of the, of the conventions. So I would tell them and uh, how, what to expect and all that stuff. So that, you know, that made me feel really cool that yeah, I, cool. I had this knowledge to, to mm-hmm. give people. So. Now, yep. uh, so so you got the uh, job, we can assume. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the show ran for seven years. Yes. And what were uh, what were some of your fondest memories uh, of that time? Like uh, uh, like you've talked a little bit about joking around uh, on the bridge between cuts and stuff. Was, yeah. was that was that camaraderie really what, like a major uh, element of the whole the whole experience? I would imagine. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, there was just. The laughs were nonstop. That camaraderie was the best. I mean, those are my my best thoughts. You know, I mean, there was um, uh, I used to, I would, uh, I would refer to it as the fart uh, as fart wars. The fart <laughs> wars were <laughs> between three different three warring nations. I said the nation of Neelix, the nation of Paris, and the nation of Tuvok. So basically, those three actors, Tim Russ, Robbie Robbie Duncan McNeil, and uh, Ethan Phillips, were were the primary members of the fart wars and (laughs) literally they would just go around and they would try to they would try to fool each other and saying that they were you know oh hey i'm coming over to talk to you and then they would basically leave pass gas i guess (laughs) um but but it it, it got to be you know but they were innocent innocent you know they were Uh innocent bystanders (laughs) such as myself who was not you know part of the fart war Uh uh but i would i was definitely a casualty i remember mcneil would knock on my trailer door and I, I'm like, come in. He'd come in. He'd go, hey, what's up, bud? He'd walk in, <laughs> turn his ass to me, fart, and then close the door. He'd hotbox me with the fart, oh, basically, okay. uh, which was just uh, absolutely a, a pain in the ass. But, you know, but it was, no it was pun it, all in good fun. Yeah, <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> um, but so really, uh, you know, my, my favorite memories were just uh, the joking around that we did. I mean, we just did so many, so many practical jokes on each other. Um so that it was just it was a lovely time in my in my life for sure that is awesome yeah um what uh g- g- like we're we're starting to run out of time and i don't want to uh i don't want to run oh, out of time before we talk about um all the other stuff that we're supposed to talk about so i just want is there one sort of fan element that like or one event with fans that sort of sticks out in your mind is the most outrageous we hear a lot of stories and you you know you see a lot of the footage on uh, on on TV and online now with uh, comic cons and stuff like that. Has yeah. there ever been like a crazy moment for you? Oh, with fans? You yeah, mean? yeah. Um, yes, um, I would say that happened in when I was in England. Um, I think it was in Birmingham. Uh, so it wasn't London. It was further north. And oh, we cannot have that. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> 
essentially i i was sitting there in line signing autographs and this woman was in a wheelchair and she was she was she saw me and she started yelling you know oh it's harry young harry kim i love you i love you i'm like hi <laughs> okay and so she wheeled away all right um she then wheeled back again she's in the wheelchair she's she's missing one leg she's he has one leg obviously an accident or something happened years ago and and three hours later when she came back she was pissed drunk i mean she had been <laughs> just hitting the bar like you wouldn't believe so she wheels the table up and i can see in her eyes immediately this woman's just three sheets to the wind and she goes she goes hello and I'm like, oh, my gosh, here it goes. <laughs> and she lunges out of her wheelchair onto the table in front of me and shimmies up. With, and this is within like two, uh, 0.6 seconds she does all this, right? Wow. So she lunges out, lands on the table, and shimmies on the table towards me very quickly, grabs me by my shirt and pulls me into her. And first she says, she says, I love this shirt on you. I go, thank you. And I mean, I, my nose is like an inch away from her nose. And, I, and then she goes, so tell me, are you going to be my after dinner mint? Oh, oh, no, 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 no. And so I looked at her and I said, I said, I'm sorry, but I, I'm, I, I have a girlfriend. I, I can't, you know, I can't uh, accept your, 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 your overtures towards me. And um, <laughs> when I said that, her face went from lust to anger in, in like a split second. <laughs> wow. And she reared back. And I could see it. It was all slow motion. Her right hand went back in a, a form of a slapping motion. And she, I just see her hand coming towards me. I'm like, no, my God, this is not happening. <laughs> and I could just see in the, from the sides of my eyes all the convention promoter people, the handlers, are, they're just also in shock. And they're like – they're like, mm, it's all slow mo. They're like, no. And I'm looking at the hand going, ah. And sure enough, she slapped the bejesus oh. out of me. Oh, yeah. Oh. I mean, just, just reared back and went bam just and then she got back into her wheelchair and wheeled away that was it <laughs> right that was okay. it um wow. funny thing was this this woman actually showed up at this london uh, the, the uh, milton Keynes convention i was at last weekend and the wheelchair came up and i just felt this like all the hair stand up on the back of my neck and everything i'm like oh my god is this her and it was it was her oh, wow. she goes she goes do you remember me back in i, I was like oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. i remember you I, and I kept thinking like is this my cue to slap her back right now i mean should i i don't know um and Cosmic i just justice yeah so then i asked her i said do you do you remember what you did and she goes well i came up to your table and blah 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 and i got your autograph i go no 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 you came up and you grabbed me by my shirt <laughs> and 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 she goes i told you you had a nice shirt and i said yes you did but then after that when you asked me to be your after dinner mint and i said no <laughs> you slapped the bejesus out of me and she goes what and i said yes and she goes what are you talking about i go well i guess you blacked out or you were in an alcohol blackout because yeah you slapped the bejesus out of me woman and she just kind of denied the whole thing you know so that was it so you that on film wow oh, i know okay <laughs> well, hope, well we'll try to keep you from being slapped in gen con How's right that? well yeah <laughs> that's i'm telling you that is the most rare and uh, that was an anomaly it was a total anomaly that 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 that, that, that happened because 99.9999% of the fans are very, very courteous, generous, and kind. You know, you don't have, oh, yes, you know, yeah. yeah, they're not attacking. I mean, does do any of the other uh, cast members from any of the Star Treks have a story where they got slapped? Probably not. Yeah, we'll see, there you go. That's a distinction. I can guarantee you, I'm the only one. And it's so funny because everything and everything in Vo on Voyager, everything happened to Ensign Kim. Literally, right. torture, beatings, you know, whatever, right. you know, the wrong girl. So it's sort of like, oh, it was par for the course that there I get go. slapped by a man in a way. You know, there you it's continuing. There you go. Continued life imitating art. Right. That's right. So um, we got, we're running out of time here, but we did want to ask you about what you're excited about to see at Gen Con. I know uh, Terrace has got quite a few games set up for you there. Has he so, described? So we, have we actually said that 
that uh, that Garrett's going to be with the Geek Nation Tours folks, so we're going to actually be able to to, oh. to spend time with Garrett and, and play Never games with him. I, I don't Never think we know. We that. should say that. that. We should we probably should. do that. Terrace probably wants games. us to do that. Yeah. Right. There's a dice uh, Space Cadets dice duel event is one of the yeah. things. Yes, yes. indeed. Uh, each player gets to take a, ver- uh, a different bridge station, yeah, right. weapons, information navigation. Right. And you're competing against another bridge crew. That's one. Yeah. 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 yeah right. There's a there's some type of Artemis spaceship simulator event. Uh, yeah. You got a team a going. More. Yeah, I think I think that's going to have. You're going to get an unfair advantage on that one. You are. But, you, you are. Know. But but just be uh, aware that whatever station that you're at is going to explode and sparks and knock you over. <laughs> you know. Okay. <laughs> that's how that works. Uh, okay. They're going for realism here. Right. 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 All right. Right. I'll bring my goggles. Yeah. Be ready. <laughs> be ready. By the way, there's is there special the Star Trek you. training for that? For when you know the bridge gets hit, you all all rock to the left. Did they did they synchronize that? There, there is. There is. <laughs> it's very funny. But um, we. Uh, <laughs> You know, they, every time they say, they'll say, shake, you know, and we're supposed to do some shaking. And, and after the pilot was finished, after we finished filming Caretaker, which took 31 days to film. Wow. Um, wow. People don't know this, but Robbie McNeil, Paris and I, we worked 30 of the 31 days. Janeway worked 16 of the 31 days. <laughs> wow. Okay. The doctor, Bob Picardo, worked two of the 31 days. And well, he was a hologram. Like, right. Yeah, yeah. But I got a little source, buddy. I paid like twice as much as I did for the pilot. But we're not bitter, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hello, what is it? State, state the nature of the medical emergency. Hello. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, you know, I, I just, <laughs> I think that. Um, uh, where are we going with this? I lost track on this one too. Oh, uh, just uh, how you shake. Shaking Special shake the, training. Uh, oh, the shaking. Yes, yes, yes. So after we filmed the pilot, we all got a package sent to us. FedEx package. Uh, at home because there, there was a bit of time downtime between the pilot and when we came back to film mm-hmm. the second episode, basically of the season one. Right there was we had three weeks of downtime, mm-hmm. and um, so everyone got this package in the mail. I open it up and it's and there's a letter in there and a, and it says, "Dear, dear uh, uh, Voyager cast member, blah blah blah. Congratulations on getting your your role on Star Trek Voyager. My name is Kim Friedman. I am the director who will be directing your first episode back." I had a chance to watch the pilot episode Caretaker that you have all worked on. um, Good job. Good job across the board, except for one area, shaking. None of you (laughs) know how to shake. Okay. Uh, And I'm thinking, what? She goes, when the ship gets hit or rocked by phaser fire or or, or by other type of armament, weaponry, whatever, (laughs) you have to shake correctly. (laughs) To shake correctly, you must shake from your center and let your extremities follow. Do not bend over at the waist. Do not do this. (laughs) It all happens from your center like that. And she said, practice this in a mirror, you know, and and, and get this down before you come back. And she goes, I've included... I have included an, uh, 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 um, an edited version of all the episodes of D Space Nine that I've worked on where all the <laughs> actors are shaking correctly. Like that. Just follow their lead and learn from them. And then, and then, Everybody's and so got their thing. So watch the VHS you know, tape here, and, and it has all the, the proper shaking. If you are still unable to shake in the correct fashion, please – Please approach any Deep Space Nine actor and ask for a demonstration. <laughs> That's awesome. There I am. I'm thinking I'm going to go knock on Avery Brooks' door, right? <laughs> yeah, what is it? Uh, yes, Mr. Brooks, just here to see if uh, you could give me a, a demonstration on how to shake. <laughs> Get out of my trailer. Get out of my trailer. <laughs> Kick you in your butt. That's awesome. Shake so, 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 Garrett, when, uh, when you do Artemis, I'm going to watch carefully make sure the shaking is proper. Then. I want right, to see professional, yeah. All right. professional well, I'm going to be watching shaking. so I can emulate the shape. Right, right. <laughs> okay. So, so after good. Artemis, you guys, you're doing True Dungeon now. Has Terrace brought you up to speed on the whole True Dungeon thing? Do you know how no, this works? No, no. Terrace has just, just told me, get, just get ready. There's going to be all types of games you're going to so be playing. True Dungeon so. is crazy. It's like live action Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it's, oh really? But it's you not, don't have. It's not an acting thing. You're not, not acting, acting as a character. It's more like you just move from. One cool little well, uh, we think they're cool. You might actually not think they're so cool, right? Okay, uh, we, we're like these are cool, like movie sets. They're not like movie sets. Right. We're oh. so sadly we now have to admit <laughs> that when we say they're really like movie sets, they're they're not like movie. Sets. Well, they're, they're cool for normal people. They're like low budget movie sets. Yeah, they're, yeah, from like, <laughs> like you know, be, a, no a, original a, series a, Star a, Trek, like original <laughs> series Star Trek. You know, you're on yeah. the air quotes planet, and there's a few red sheets and a, and a styrofoam rock. 
That's yeah. about where we it's are. It's actually better than that. Yeah, so it's, it's somewhere that. between that. So it's somewhere between the original series and early yeah. next gen in terms of set quality. All right. And you it's know? mostly like puzzle stuff. And as a team, right. you have to like solve these cool puzzles. And you, right. it's in the room. So you're there's like three dimensional elements of the puzzles. And all of the combat is actually kind of like ski ball. Uh, not ski ball, but. Uh, um, what is it like air air hockey? But it doesn't really oh, blow up. Yeah. It's just you're sliding these discs on a uh, right. on a on a on a sheer uh, surface that has a, the monster sort of drawn on it. Oh, so, okay. So it's gotcha. it's very cool and abstract. It's not you're not like forsooth. Now therefore we shall go and fall. You know, it's right. not, you don't have, I mean, I'm sure somebody does that, but most people don't. <laughs> right. So that that's a lot of fun. That's and then he's a lot got a whole. You got he's got you lined up for a whole bunch of, of really interesting board games. Spartacus based on the TV. You know the the the. Oh, have oh, you wow. seen the TV show? No, no. TV I show. have seen Spartacus. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to be all set for the theme because every, pretty much every card has is like R rated. Yeah, which is great. Um, really nice. Awesome. It's all the humor. It's all of the. It's it's. And it's, you cannot win that game without working together and then utterly destroying everybody else. Right. So it's oh, wow. really it's a very cool sort of a social game with a neat little mini game in the middle where your your, your gladiators have to fight it out, or actually you can manipulate other people's gladiators have to fight. Uh, and it's very easy to learn. So that's I think cool. you're going to love that one. And I cool. also uh, Terrace did say you're you're interested in history. So there's yes. some vague history right there, sort of, kind of a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we already talked oh. about descent. Yeah, Which yeah, he's okay. got you signed up for that, so that's going to be cool. Yes. Uh, Pandemic is the best game we've never reviewed on our show. Yeah, it's great. Cool. Uh, <laughs> lots of world world pla- uh, world plague. So it's a, yeah, it's a exactly. Great it's all about plagues. And then, nice. of course, Werewolf, which I think you'll have fun with as well, which is basically... Yeah, that's um, going to be at the dinner. That's that's a very social game where everybody just sits around in a circle and uh, yeah. kill and we tell you the story about who's going to... And the werewolves have to sneak around and kill people. Yeah. 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 You guys have seen Being Human, right? Both oh, yes. The UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good, yeah. Good, good show. Right? Great Both, show, yeah. yeah. Love the show. Yep. Same uh, man, the UK, the, the US cast, those guys are hilarious at conventions. If you're ever at a co- convention yeah. and that cast is there, opt for the group photo with all of them. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay? okay. They sit there. They do not do the standard posing, um, but they have standard cool poses that they do, though. It's oh, yeah. hilarious that they, that they can go to. They're like, okay, the ballet thing. And everyone gets in like <laughs> ballet pose, right? They do one thing where they're all dead on the ground. And the fan, and <laughs> the fan is the only person left alive. He's standing there and they're all dead on the floor and, and splayed. <laughs> out in front of him it's hilarious they're mm-hmm. so so um fun loving and and inventive and creative in their photo op sessions so awesome. i've sort of taken i mean i i also do some funny stuff too for instance <laughs> um I, I i the original person that i saw do funny photos was paul mcgillian from uh, stargate atlantis i thought yeah. wow he's done some great stuff there were shots of him like piggybacking fans and you know <laughs> c- cradling them like babies you know like things like that and that that i thought wow this is so much better than the standard you know just standing next to them and, and take a picture and smile you just you add some humor to it they love uh-huh. it they love a little bit of something different that's, and that's awesome. something that i've taken into my photo ops too so yeah so so garrett so why don't you go because it's getting late and we thank you so much for your okay. time what's sure. what's next on your on your play you going to any big conventions lately you got any big uh, shows coming up or anything what's going on uh well you know i've sort of taken an involuntary break from hollywood since oh, 05 so yeah. i've really just been traveling the world in the yeah. last nine years and just doing wow. doing conventions every now and then but um in a state of semi-retirement i suppose nice. Um, uh, about three weeks ago, I got cast to do uh, some voices for American Dad. So oh, I did some voiceover oh, nice. work for American Dad. Oh, yeah, very cool. so that's going to be kind of cool to have nice. that come out. So, so we'll I, if people, people want to follow your antics and know what conventions you're going to be at. Do you have a web presence anywhere people can check? Uh, out? You know what? There, there's a no, but there. I mean, I pretty much I, I tweet all the time. I was going to so, say we know uh, he tweets. That's right. Yeah, and it's not. It's not. It's very strange because if you type in at Garrett G A R R E T T W A N G like my name straight across, uh, a profile comes up that's locked. But as you swipe the screen over, there's a it's there's a Facebook link there, and when you click it, it goes to my real Facebook. But that's not me. This dude, Weird. I don't know who set this up, <laughs> but I I want to kick his you know. So I'm like, what? Um, but the reason why he got that name was because I sort of when Jerry Ryan Jerry Ryan was the first person on Voyager to start tweeting, and yeah. she has tweeted you know thirty nine thousand tweets by this point, <laughs> and she got me into it. But her name is Jerry. L Ryan. So she takes Lynn, her middle name, uh, as her, you know, so I thought it'd be cute right. if I did the same thing. So I, when I first got onto Twitter, I, I made my address at Garrett R W A N G, not knowing that this 
hooligan was going to take my real name right. and then actually pretend it's really me, uh, but he does oh. nothing. And so I've even sent a you know follow request to this guy because I want to talk to him and he doesn't even answer <laughs> that. So I don't I don't even know. You well, know, that's got to make a be a little nerve wracking, right? Yeah. But once I, you've I had think... the cojones to do that and the real guy knocks on your door, that's got to be a little nerve. <laughs> I know. I need to find some people that work at Twitter so I can there you know have them dismantle <laughs> this guy as quick as possible. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that you can find out where I, I talk about where I go, but there's also some type of site that that tracks every. Trek star at every convention. I don't know the I don't know the web address for it, but I think if you do some Google searching, you'll find it uh, where it just shows all their appearances. But I will be um, I will be in Germany coming up uh, next week uh, at FedCon, the largest German convention. Cool. Um, and then um, I will also be at Evolution Con in the San Jose, Oakland area, uh, which is uh, Julie Caitlin Brown's convention, her first convention. That's um, That'll be coming up. Um, I'm, I may be at Phoenix Comic Con. I don't know. I haven't even talked to those guys. I, I said that I might come back again in the second year. Um, but definitely at Dragon Con. Uh, awesome. For those of you who have not been to Dragon Con, that that is the that is the event to go to. Yeah, um, that's what I hear. I always have people. I always have fans coming up to me saying the same thing. Oh my gosh, my dream is to go to San Diego Comic Con. It's my dream. Mm. And I look at them and I say, you know what? I don't know if you really want to follow that dream because it's so corporate. It's so it's just yeah. you know it's it's just every every studio hawking their latest piece of crap, whatever it is. You know that, that it's, they're all there. That's what it is. It's it's just it's one big preview is what it is. Yeah. And of the two hundred fifty thousand people that are there, two hundred forty nine thousand are fourteen years old <laughs> or younger. And they're running around trying to get the freebies that every studio is giving out, like right. a free keychain or, or I'm number one or a Spock hand or whatever it is. You know, it's like, right. oh my god, please! Um, and they're in your way when you want to go to the bathroom. So what should be what should take you three minutes to walk to a bathroom takes forty two <laughs> minutes to get there because all the thirteen and fourteen year olds that are in your way. Yeah. Um, and then you know people say, well, what about the cosplay? I go, okay, watch any video on YouTube about the cosplay at at San Diego Comic Con. Yeah, you'll have the guy interviewing interviewing the hot girl in cosplay, but watch everyone who's walking behind. Nobody else is in cosplay. Right. Okay, so mm. if you look at the actual percentage of the two hundred fifty thousand, I think it's less than one percent that are actually in cosplay. Yeah. Okay. It's not like Dragon you go to Dragon Con, right? yeah. it's probably forty five to fifty percent that are in cosplay. Yeah. And cosplay that you wouldn't even imagine that existed. You look at that and say, "Excuse me, did you steal that from the set? Because that's camera ready. What you're wearing, you know, yeah. uh, it's unbelievable how much time and money and effort." that these southern fans put into their costuming but it's amazing and also there's a night component to uh dragon con that san diego comic con does not have i mean yes sci-fi channel will have their independent party whatever and that's impossible for anyone to get into mm. unless you're on a sci-fi show um uh they'll have that going but these are these are random you know events that are not really related to the convention whereas uh dragon con after the daytime programming is done, which is 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. of panels about you know actors, writers, uh, special effects people, whatever. Uh, once that's done, they have the night component, which means every every uh, hotel, all five of the hotels that that host Dragon Con that are next to each other in downtown Atlanta, they then have night events. So if you want to go see a punk band. Okay, you can go to this venue and watch a punk band play. You want to go to a rave? There's a huge rave going off on another <laughs> nice. uh, ballroom of another hotel. It's amazing, people. Yeah. It really is. It really is. It's nice. geek nirvana. It's geek heaven. Awesome. Way more than San Diego Comic Con. So I will be at that. I'm that. I'm there every year because I direct. Uh, I volunteered to be the director of the Trek Track. Um, oh, cool! Which wow, means nice. I, I handle all the programming for all Trek uh, programming that goes on there. So very cool. Well, that's quite a retirement. That is, it is. It's pretty busy for a retired guy. Yeah, it say. is. I know. I'm, I'm and and for folks who want to track you down, I did find there's a website called Star Trek Appearances dot blogspot dot com, and it does have everybody listed. And I could actually see you're going to be at the Hotel Maritime in Dusseldorf, Germany. <laughs> Very good. That's and, right. Uh, and then later, of course, the Rio Suites Hotel, the official Star Trek convention in oh, Las I Vegas. Oh, about that. Yes, yeah. yes, in July. So look, I'm an expert now. <laughs> you are. You can tell what everyone is. Right I can now. tell where everyone is. Do you want to know where David Warner is? <laughs> what about Michael Welch? How about Peter Weller? I... Uh, well, and 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 uh, sadly, it took me like five minutes to figure out that it was alphabetical. I was like, "Oh, Garrett, where are you? Where are you? These are all A's." Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> well, Garrett, thank you so much again for taking time oh, out of your busy great. retirement 
to join us here on our little podcast in this corner. I of had a wonderful time interacting with you two fine gentlemen. So <laughs> thank, um, you. thank you so much to yourselves too. Well, thanks again. Thank Best you. of luck at your upcoming conventions and uh, and super excited to actually get to meet you face to face in Indianapolis and play some games and just hang out. That's going to be, be awesome. awesome. Oh, wait, you guys going to be there, too? We are. We're going to be there, yeah. Who do you think is going to be running this werewolf game? Yeah, right. You got it. That's right. Right right on. I will see you, and I will high-five you. Awesome, Garrett. Well, we'll see you in Indy, then. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you very much, Garrett. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Right. This is Total Fangirl. Regular Jane most days, Total Fangirl when the moment strikes. Han shot first. Starbucks is a guy, and Lestat now stares a vampire. Hey everyone, this is Nicole, your Total Fangirl. You can follow me on Twitter at Nicole Wakelin or check out my blog, TotalFangirl.com. And this week's shout-out is actually to me, and the shout-out is, will you please watch Alien already? 35 years is too long to procrastinate seeing this amazing classic film. I will, I promise. I've been so busy and traveling so much that I haven't even watched films that are current, much less films that are 35 years old. But Alien is on my list to watch, and I swear to God, I will watch it, and I will let you guys know if it gave me nightmares for the next, like, 12 years, which is pretty much what I'm expecting, or maybe the next 35 years to be all balanced. Actually, I'm going to talk about a movie today that I want to see that I haven't seen yet that has just come out. And because I was traveling and on the road and, and out in Detroit driving Fords and in uh, Alabama driving Hyundais, I didn't get a chance to see the movie when it was released. And now I'm like behind because it came out last week. And that's the latest Transformers movie. Now, I really like cars and I really like, you know, sci-fi, robot, future, blah, blah, blah stuff. So Transformers should be a movie that I really, really love. So therefore, I am stupidly excited about this movie. But then there's that whole, what did Michael Bay do to this movie? And I am, I admit, a little bit nervous. But I'm trying to go into it and just thinking, you know, okay, explosions, destruction, explosions, destruction, explosions, destruction. Just try and get past it. But now I'm starting to see some of my friends talking about it. And even the friends that aren't all, oh, well, this movie did not live up my expectations with the Transformers franchise and it's not correct and blah, blah, blah. Even those kind of people who aren't like that, who are just willing to go to a movie and have a good time, they're kind of not liking it. And it's making me nervous. In fact, I had one friend who went to see the movie. And this friend, in fact, has two little boys who are just, you know, target market for Transformer stuff as far as kids go. And the kids didn't like it, which may have been the more damning review of all the reviews that I've seen. Because kids don't care about explosions and all that stuff. And they don't care if it's, you know, oh, there was too much destruction. They just want to go see a movie that they like the characters. They get to see some Transformers. Bumblebee does his thing and they have a good time. And these kids said that it didn't. They said that they thought it really wasn't very good and they didn't like the story and that some of it was kind of scary, which is fine. That's a kid rating on things. And I get that things can get scary, but yeah, when when kids don't like a movie, I feel like something's off. And in general, people haven't been giving it good ratings. So now, and it's ironic, given the shout out that I had at the beginning of this episode, I am left with a choice to go see Transformers in the movie theaters and see for myself and spend the better part of a month's income on popcorn and soda and candy and comfy seats that recline when I sit down in the theater and the tickets or not going to see Transformers. And I'm I'm almost debating not seeing it. Like I have so much going on this summer. I have so many wonderful things to do and so many places to go. And oh my gosh, life is so hectic. And do I want to spend all that time in the theater watching Transformers? So I think maybe not going to see this before everybody else did may have been kind of damning for me because now I'm questioning whether I should see it at all or just wait. I'm sure Russ would probably have something to say about that and it would probably be something along the lines of, are you crazy woman? We're going to see Transformers. But still, I think some of the excitement is gone and I don't know, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe my considerably lowered expectations will actually make this movie a heck of a lot of fun. We'll have to see. Maybe I'll actually have a time to see it by the time the next episode airs. That's all for now. Bye, everyone. Ah, uh, yes.
yeah, there's the trumpet. That means it's time for Vic the Viking. I like to think of it as a war horn. Or a war horn or trumpet or maybe a Viking grabbing the side of his helmet and blowing yeah, into it. Which there you go. totally doesn't work, but it sounds right. All kinds uh, of cool stuff going you on. You know, our friends at the war store have been bringing the war to your door since 1999, which is, let's just be honest, forever, which is yeah. awesome because it means they know what they're doing. They're doing it right. They have the best service, the best a products. Dec- that's a decade and a half. It is, and... Some of the best prices on the net. It they are crazy. by far my favorite internet games broker. I know, right? They, they have they're, just... they're, 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 the quality of their service is amazing. Their mm-hmm. prices are great. And they get all of the cool stuff as early as possible so that you can go there just to check out the cool new stuff. There's all kinds of – you're playing Infinity. You're looking forward to Infinity mm-hmm. 2. First of all, the best place to find out what Infinity is available in America is to immediately go to the War Store because it's always on their front page, the new releases, the new wave. And, of course, Infinity churns out models after, model after model every yeah. month. On top of that, they've got a whole new cool set of terrain available that's ideal for any sci-fi game, but in particular for uh, Infinity – um, I mean, really, they've got almost everything. They've also got board games. They've got role-playing games. They've got dice. They've got rulers. They've got all kinds of cool stuff. Oh, but really, man. they are awesome from beginning to end for their service. They really are. And they also carry the hotness, as Craig mentioned, very quick and early on. They just got all this brush for hire terrain in now, which looks so incredible. Looks crazy. I'm like, oh, no, that is awesome. So um, check it all out. they got t- terrain. they got miniatures. they got brushes. they got paints. they Basically, if you are a miniature gamer, they have the supplies you need to do whatever you need to do. Yep. Head on over to thewarstore.com. I am Rafe Hollywood Granger, and this is the Hollywood Minute. Right, it's me, Ray Hollywood Granger, doing a different intro now because my editor, that's Russ, is uh, on a tight deadline tonight, and I, for the first time ever, completely forgot to record this segment that you now have before you. So due to the vagrancies of the warp, I was able to get this in just under the wire before Russ, the ogre taskmaster, had to ship this episode. So, here's what's on my mind. Two things. Let me talk to you about Gen Con. I'm getting a lot of emails. Uh, Luke Melia from uh, What Would Patton Do? Oh, excuse me, WWPD. I know the old school name. Is heading out to Gen Con, of course. Greg Silberman, Doc, um, a bunch of my Moss, uh, Tyler, a bunch of my Jaffo, a bunch of my Ohio friends. I wonder if I'm going to go to Gen Con. And I want to go. This is the year I skipped last year to do some home projects and... uh I want to go. So the so I've I've got my tickets. I've got the hotels booked. Andy and I are going to road trip out there, and I'm a little bit frustrated because um, I've been working on my budget both for my firm and for my home under uh, the Dave Ramsey style, which is you just don't if you don't have money you just don't spend it. I don't live on credit, and um, in cranking the budget, we looked at the summer schedule between when there were gaps in camps and. Being able to stay home, holiday coverage, my wife has a job, so covering when she gets called into work, I'm already out for the summer for eight days, uh, which those aren't vacation days. They're they're sort of, you know, a Wednesday here, a Monday here, a Tuesday here. Those are just coverage of home base because my kids aren't old enough to stay home by themselves. So when I factor in Gen Con, the expense of the trip and all that, I'm not talking about that. That's its own thing. I'm talking about, like, I look and I'm like, oh, boy, that would be another... Thursday, Friday, Monday, um, plus my wife works on weekends, which means I've got to get coverage for her, which is either the expense of the babysitter. So it's a, it's an expensive proposition to, um, cause basically if I'm, I'm the only, I'm a solo practitioner works for me. I like it, but if I'm not there churning the little hamster wheel, it doesn't print out dollar bills. So it's been a real, now in the past, it's been a real challenge because in the past, uh, what I've always done is I, um, I just sort of go. I'm like, ah, oh, you only live once and blah, 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 blah. But kind of like spending too much on Christmas, you know, come September, I'm like, ooh, what do I did? I'm so far behind. 
Um, so the reason why I share you that is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's awkward to share that with you, but I kind of always made a promise to just tell you the truth here on the, on the Hollywood minute. So it's been interesting. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to wrangle that down and make sure that there's, you know, uh, it's not Christmas in July basically. And I don't face a January. So I'm still, I'm 90% there in my brain. Um, and and this is all me, by the way. This isn't my spouse. She's she's supportive. I mean, obviously, she wants to make sure the bills are covered, but the decision's up to me to make, and I get support if I go. So, so that's so that's why if, if people are asking and I'm not responding, that's sort of why I don't want to give any false presentations or false hope. Um, so I'm super looking forward to it. I'm super looking forward to catch up with, with all my old friends. And I'm uh, looking forward to the trip with Andy, and I think it's getting closer to work. We've got some friends and family reaching out to take care of the kids, and so now I just have to kind of give me an old booster shot in the arm. Oh, and then, you know, since I'm retired, uh, I'm in retired status of the of the D6G, you know, my pension uh, just doesn't cover uh, the expenses like back in the day. So, so anywho, so uh, some people have kind of nosed around and asked about it, and I thought I would reveal behind the curtain. And, um, so that's the little Dr. Oz behind the curtain. And, uh, I keep thinking about, you know, I've got this great blog that I, oh, and the reason why I don't do that blog, I think I told you, I love having that blog and I still get hits to it and I like my little articles, but, um, you know, I, I type at a computer all day and so it seems like to write another article. So I keep thinking like, ah, oh, I should do kind of what I do here with the Hollywood Minute and just like stick them on the blog and have little blog articles but I never know if it's worth the effort if you guys would like that. So send me a shout out. If you're like, yeah, man, just post whatever in your blog. We'll read it. Or, or you know, now nah, we get enough information now with all the podcasts that are out there plus the D6G. I'd be curious to know, you know, maybe I'll go back to doing my audio pod blog again and, and uh, so on and so forth. I'm also hoping to go out and uh, get a chance to interview Matt Wilson unless that's also on Craig and Russ's calendar. I forgot to ask if they're intending to do that, but if I go out there and they're not intending to do that, I'll definitely do that if Matt's available. Um, okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is I'm having a blast, 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 blast playing League of Legends. Very rare. I know I'm behind the times, but very rare for me to like a game like this because I usually stink at click games and trigger games. I'm not fast enough. And I do want to get this out to Wakeland, so I'm not going to blab too much about it. But I want to say that I'm having a real fun time at my level. I'm not getting pwned. I'm winning matches. I'm losing matches. So if anybody out there has liked real-time strategy games but get frustrated because you just get pwned, this is not a real-time strategy game, but it reminds me enough of one. I watched, I picked one character. He was a beginner character. I watched one YouTube video, have friend friends that are experienced they told me the meta behind it and i'm having an absolute blast on league of legends if you want to look me up i am stone ithriel it's basically stony with thrill s-t-o-n-i-t-h-r-i-a-l that's my wow tunes character he's a cleric um and you can follow me on hollywood at the d6 generation i did get my filters working and you can follow me on Twitter as D6G Hollywood. Oh, and go see Chef with John Favreau. Love, love, love that movie. Go check it out. Chowy Finale. Until next time. <laughs>
Game Salute's the way to go as well. Head on over to GameSalute.com, right, Craig? Game That's Salute. right. Game Salute does so much for us. They, they not only do. are they helping these guys put their stuff up on Kickstarter, they're helping them design their games. Mm-hmm. They're also a great clearinghouse for games. They're a clearinghouse for gaming news. They really have their finger on just about every pulse of the gaming industry. That's right. So when you go to the Game Salute website, click on the Games button. You'll see all the cool titles there. Some yeah. new stuff coming out, the new hotness, like the Alien Frontiers reprint, the new Alien Frontiers factions, all the other new expansions for that coming out. Area 1851, Craig and I have talked about before. Great stuff. Yep. Um, all the games are there. And if you choose to order a game online from Game Salute, make sure you use the code D6G149 for extra bonus goodies and or savings, depending on the uh, month it right. is. So check yep. it all out over at GameSalute.com. GameSalute.com. This is the D6 Generation Podcast. More fun than Merchant of Venus. Wait, what? Who writes this? That's impossible. Hey, welcome back. And we decided that what we would do is try to get you guys a little insight into uh, what some of our Patreon patrons uh, get to do, like hang out with cool guys like us. So we're going to record this quarter's patron hangout. That's not so good on the fly. But, uh, and so anyway, so what we've got here is a Skype call where patrons get to call in and we just chat, like, uh, you know, just hanging out with gamers after, uh, after a game night. And, uh, with us today, we have Brian and say hello, Brian. Hello. And Joel. Hello. And John. Hello. And Duncan. Hello. And Robert. Hello. And, uh, Charlie the Cherub. Jason, did you get Jason already? What? I'm here. Hey, I Jason. don't have I don't have a Jason on. Jason's my on the call also. See? Oh well, there you go. Already. Tech, and we're going on the fly here with technical difficulties. <laughs> right. Jason is here as well. Excellent. And Hello. Uh, people may or may not be joining as we go. But anyway, right. what we generally do with these is we just chat and we take questions and we have make comments and we give questions and we just talk about uh, whatever pops into anybody's heads as we go. Right. Would anyone like to start the conversation? Who's got a question? I do. All right, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering, since starting the podcast, how uh, this has changed your interactions on Tuesday nights or your gaming nights with the group there. <laughs> oh, uh, that is an awesome I'm question. I'm going to defer that to Craig. <laughs> uh, I've got a two-parter, if that's okay. Oh, sure, yes, yes. Okay, you, you want to give the second part now or after hearing the initial response? I think they'll be linked, so I'd rather give it now. Okay, okay go right ahead. Uh I was wondering also, once you're doing the podcast, how has that affected your relationships with your friends through gaming? Oh, that's a good question. That's right. two very good questions. Yeah. Uh, now, if you had asked me a year and a half ago how it, how, how it affected our Tuesday nights, I would have said not at all. And if you had pressed me, I would have said, uh, you know, Russ, Rafe, and I have occasionally have to go and have dinner all alone so we can talk about business or what, whatnot, but we don't really, you know, lord it about. We don't talk about it, especially when our numbers started to get big. I never thought we really made a big deal out of it. Uh, and then the Nerd Herders started their podcast. And I don't know if it was just their, like, it was a funny thing to them to, like, constantly call us out, but it became this sort of strange one-way rivalry where uh, they would go out on their own to have dinner and discuss whatever business they were doing and make a big giant production out of it, pretending they were us. So I don't know. I think I think outside of our little bubble of three, maybe it was perceived as as something that we didn't see it as. But uh, I don't think it's changed our our gaming on Tuesday nights as far as our relationship with the overall social group goes. Uh, it has made it very difficult to keep with one game for any length of time no matter how much we love it because a russ is a bastard and b we constantly (laughs) it's true it's true we we constantly have to play new games so that we can review them so there's a pressure there that was never there before Mm -hmm. but but russ is also very much a magpie gamer yes and he will tell you that he still loves this game as much as he did yesterday, <laughs> but he's not playing it. He's playing this other game. Well, yes. And you'll be like, Russ, I just spent $200 on terrain. And he'll be like, yeah, no, no, we'll play it again. But right now we're playing this. And you're like, mm, track record indicates that we will play this again in about three years. Right. Don't sell it. Don't sell yeah, that stuff. Yeah, yeah don't, don't sell it. It'll be up. It'll, <laughs> right. it'll be back. It'll be back. Um, so, but yeah, so they're, they're literally, I have noticed a, a massive churning effect 
uh, on my gaming. Like, I get all excited. I have this big giant table for, uh, for Crossmaster made and Crossmaster never sees the light of day again. It just disappears under this constant avalanching, churning wave of games that, oh, we gotta do something new. Oh, we gotta do something new, which is very true. And that's not Russ pushing it. It's both of us feeling this pressure that we constantly have to review the newest, the coolest, the stuff that we're at least excited about. And what that does is it sort of pushes any new hotness in any given week into the background in a few weeks, if, if at most a few months. So that's, that's huge. Um, and I've recently started thinking to, to go to your second question about my, my relationships with my friends and my gamer friends in particular through the podcast because somebody called me out this week. Uh-oh. And, uh, it was, it was a little, it was a little rough. I don't think I heard about this. I mean, Uh-oh. no, Gossip. no, can What's we, that? Can we talk? Don't forget this is on the air, so you know. No, I know. Oh, I'm not, no, I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> believe me, I know. Um, <laughs> and the, it, the the issue was, like, uh, I I was asking someone, uh, or they were asking me if we were going out to eat or something, and they said, well, I don't want to get called out on Did You Ever Notice for a third time. And I was like, oh, my God, I've never called you out on Did You Ever Notice. And he was like, yeah, what about this and this? I was like, uh, well, that other one was this other guy, and – um. And so I think what I, the, a pressure I feel is that I constantly have to have something that's edgy for did you ever notice or talk about what's on my mind. But that usually ties in with what's going on in the gaming group. And I don't want to be specific and I don't want to be calling anybody out. Occasionally I do. And the situation he was talking about was when I hurt my arm really bad and I was still on medication and I kind of got left in the parking lot by all my friends. So I'm going to stand by that. I'm going to stand by the fact that, yes, I was in a parking lot by myself, medicated, having just had my arm ripped out of its socket only days before, and I was a little peeved. But, uh, but yeah, so I lately I've been, like, oh, and try, having to, like, second guess and think back and, like, did I really do that? And did I say that the way that I meant this? So... Uh, I'm I'm feeling a lot of sort of internal pressure right now on how I can deal with did you ever notice and keep it honest. But at the same time, I, I, I think I have to find other topics because I'm starting to cut a little close to the bone, I think, on the local gaming group. <laughs> Russ, would you care to uh, elaborate or give your own thoughts? Yeah, well, um, sort of the same thing. I mean, there was some unintentional tension a couple times. I don't know if your question was really about tension, but... Um, that definitely came up when I actually, um, I actually had one episode where I did a, I called someone out a couple years ago, um, and it was, um, I didn't name him, but I called it the event, and it was definitely uh, caused a lot of tension in the group. Um, but other than that, and so I stopped doing that because I realized it was, it was, and I didn't, I didn't mean it the way it came out, but it just sort of came out that way. But other than that, I, what's interesting about what Craig pointed out, which is all the rotating games, it's funny, I don't actually think about, like, I need to try a new game this week because we're going to run out of stuff to do on the show. They just sort of show up because right, I am passionate about saying, new yeah. games. So, like, for example, we just got into discourse, like, really, really heavily. And, uh, well, I say heavily. I just got introduced to do on Tuesday and I bought everything the next day because it was. <laughs> so, and, made, and made me do the same thing. No, but this, this was. Forced me, Jedi so, Mind But this was interesting because um, a local gamer and friend of the show, Chuck, um, he was he was like I play Warmer Machine with him every pretty much almost every Tuesday, and um, he's like you got to try this discourse thing. I thought it was like Pogs, but I, I want to show you it, Russ. I think you really think it's cool, and you know it's 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 basically um, discs, but it's got some really cool mechanics and it's Warhammer themed, right? So it's Warhammer Fantasy themed. And, and there's no, it's not a agility game, you know, like no, it's not dexterity. Well, it's actually a really strategic game. And, CFFG game, yes, Fantasy Flight. It's a re. It, so there's an old Disc Wars game from years ago that Fantasy Flight is reprinted and they put the Games Workshop theme from Warhammer Fantasy Battles on top of it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like four factions in the box and we'll talk about it in the future episodes so I won't get all of it now but what's interesting about it is, is this guy, you know, our friend Chuck, he got me into this and I'm like, oh my god, so I, I saw it, I immediately bought it so th- I'm playing with Myriad Salem with, with, with Chuck, I'm, I buy it, I take it to Myriad Manchester for later in the evening and I'm, I'm like showing Craig, I'm like, boom, you know, we played this and he all of a sudden like this is cool. He bought it, and our friend Matt from the Nerd Herds, he bought it. And no, it like, actually, it was Matt's. I, I believe it was a double whammy because yes. I was walking past it on my way out at the end right. of the night when I saw Matt buying it. So it's very easy for all of us in our group. We're very attracted to the new stuff. There's a couple exceptions to that. We have a couple friends. Uh, Ian from the Nerd Herds, for example, is very hardcore into the old stuff. But um, it does. I think what happens is though because people know now that I like so much of this crazy stuff, they will like. 
the, I have the game for you, Russ. And so the interaction roar is like they, um, my friends always have known me well, but then even acquaintances that I game with know me well because of the show and they know what I like and what I don't like. So I get more of that kind of interaction than I, than I used to before, which is actually really kind of cool and flattering that people to mm. me that that happens. But, um, that's, that's really the, w- the way I, I deal with it. It really is more about, um, you know, I look at when I'm playing games, I think of segments, which is sort of weird. Um, <laughs> you know, like, I'm, oh, this is a neat mechanic. This would make a great, you know, Mully Mechanics episode in the future kind of thing. But I, I think I think about that kind of stuff anyway. So I'm just very strange, I guess. Was you that, are strange. What was the second part of the question? I forget. Did I cover uh, it? How it affects your relationships with your gamer friends? And it sounds like you answered that yeah, as well. Yeah, that's pretty much, I mean, you just got to be careful with that. And it's funny, a lot of the guys... Like, I don't really think about it when I play. Like, I have a descent group that I mentioned on the show several times that I play with almost religiously. Same four guys pretty much every week. And um, they give me heck about the show all the time, but it's good natured. Like, they call themselves the D12 generation because that's one better than D6, you know? And they're, like, constantly give me, you know, when they're fighting the overlord, it's like, well, the D12 generation just dominated the D6 generation again. You know, it's that kind of stuff. But it's not. Which is totally not fair because I have nothing to do with it. Right, but it's totally not. It's just totally. So you should be the D3 generation. Right. (laughs) In that particular instance. Fair enough. Fair enough. But, yeah, so it's like that kind of stuff. So most guys just give us a hard time about it, but in a good-natured way. That was a good question. Robert's got a question. Robert, what do you, uh, what's on your mind today? Well, last night I was at my local game store and a topic came up about organized play and how there are people that will just jump from store to store that are really, really good and will, you know, get question. prizes. Mm. And then there's like always a sportsmanship award and they've found a trend where people will go in groups and vote for all their buddies oh, just so they can yeah. get that extra prize to put up on eBay. Oh. Do you ever, you know, we try to keep it, you know, so that kids can have a chance and it, these guys that just swoop in and you never see them week to week. And all of a sudden these guys show up, swoop up all the prizes, disappear for six months. And do you guys ever have that kind of problem at, at your end? Mm, we don't have a lot of uh, our, the store, the like myriad games doesn't do a lot of, a lot of uh, organized play unless it's sort of organized by the players. So there's a lot of star Trek going on lately. Uh, the start, the, the what's that? The attack wing. Yeah, the attack wing. Yeah, um, that's huge at our place too. Yeah, but cool. that's all like the same group, and it's weird because it's almost like what you're describing, except they're never at the store ever, and then they come to the store to play this tournament, and they always seem very happy. And I've never heard anybody complain. But it's not like they're, you know, they're 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 muscling in on somebody else. They literally are never around, and then all of a sudden they dominate a Tuesday night, and then they're gone again. Well, I heard a story last night about. There was a guy that was about to win an X-Wing game and um, was literally browbeaten and verbally intimidated into conceding just so that the other guy could get the full win instead of the partial win. And they were manipulating the points to get certain awards. And it was Uh, was almost like, well, that's not – the. I mean, you might see that in regular sports, but boy, you know – now, it's just now, amazing to hear that people that, will go to certain in, lengths to just get these limited prizes that are going to be out in a few months anyway. Yeah, you know? That sounds ludicrous to me, but in all fairness, we should tell everybody that you do live in Chicago. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> wow. Um, well, we think, do get dead people to vote. So. <laughs> right. right. Well, that happened. Come and play, play Star Trek after you're dead. Play yeah. early and play often. <laughs> you get a lot of crossover in your store from miniature gamers because that reminds me of like the miniature gaming community from the 90s, right? So yeah. there used to be a time in early miniature war gaming where you had that kind of s- stuff and I think the tone of it changed and a lot of people kind of started frowning upon it and there's sort of like a unwritten sort of like sportsmanship code now in most miniature war gaming groups where you don't I know it still happens, but you don't get as much of it. But I'm thinking X-Wing because it's sort of a, it's taken a cues from Miniature War Game. It made these really high-end tournaments with really cool prizes, but maybe you've got a slightly different group of players. Maybe you got well, more, it just seemed like, it just you know, seems silly that people are going crazy for a prize that everyone's going to be able yeah, to buy if, I, if you just wait a few months. And they just want to get it one and thing get could, it turned around. One thing I would recommend to the judges there uh, is we used to do, because – we used to run a lot of GW tournaments and stuff back in the day, and there were similar challenges like this. And so we spent a lot of time and effort and brain power on trying to figure out, like, how do you get people to bring balanced armies? How do you prevent, you know, teams of local players not coming in and disrupting the tournament any more than they should within the framework of the of the system, that kind of stuff. And one of the things we implemented was judges, very you know, independent judges that judged 
everything. So at some, you want to have a small light tournament, you could have like people vote on best painted, people vote on best sportsman. The problem with that though is, is as you mentioned, in small events with, with a large chunk of friends, they can rig it. So if you have judges going around, they're just kind of watching and, and watching the games and, and kind of making notes themselves. I know it takes a little more staffing and it's harder, but, um, that can help with that because it'll prevent that kind of stuff. But it is, you know, then you got to have a really good judge who's fair minded and, and, and can kind of spot those things. It's hard, but yeah, they, well, they do a great job of trying to keep it, you know, because the, the thing obviously they don't want is, is for someone to show up and go, well, I'm never coming to this store again. It's, you know, and you yeah. know, we want to try to get regular people and, and have them stay. Right. So. Yeah, it's, it's been a challenge, but uh, they do a great job over there. Yeah. So I would I would say, I mean, the, the one massive failure in your whole story to me is any organize uh, in, in any uh, event organizer allowing the behavior that you just described, where a group of people were browbeating another player into uh, and into conceding is uh, well. That's, I guess, that's all on that's all on the event organizer in my mind. Yeah, I mean, and it's terrible was behavior. Told, it wasn't. But, well, from what I was told, it wasn't at this particular store. It was at a different yeah. store, and this is a guy that goes from store to store to play, and he was talking about it. It was all, you know, he was just flabbergasted that he saw it went on, and it was one of those things that soured him away from the other, another store. Mm-hmm. And so it did. Yeah, this incident know. didn't happen at our store, but it was just one of those things where they have to keep watching for it. And I was just wondering if that's the kind of thing you guys in, encounter. No, that sounds awful absolutely horrible to me but like i mean i think russ had some really good points on yeah. how to how to uh, sort of address it as much as possible awesome hey i know uh sorry i didn't want to cut you off there i know um we got more to talk about but andy's just online i'm going to bring andy into the call here oh let's see so andy here welcome we go. We're, we're dialing in andy right now and uh while he jumps in here uh Hey guys! Hey Andy! Hey Andy! So Andy's in the call, and Andy, just so you know, we're recording this for an episode, and uh, we've been talking about fairness in tournaments, which is pretty fun. Um, Fair enough. I'll try to be on my best behavior and leave all my salty language in the dustbin. There yes, you go. Please do that. No, no one wants salty <laughs> language. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> right. Keep, um, keep your internal sailor in check. So Bob, I'll do, we, do my best. No promises. Bob, did we cover <laughs> your topic there for you? Yes. No, thank you. That Good. was Joel. All Joel right. had a question. Joel, what was your question? So uh, I was in my gaming closet the other day, and something fell down. It was the uh, the, the Dust Tactics starter box, and um, so I, I started <laughs> I started looking at the models, and I said, I, and remembering, ah, oh, this was a really cool game. Whatever happened to it? So I I hopped online, and I see that um, Battlefront now is putting out Dust Tactics, and they have mm-hmm. a 2.0 rule set, and it, I, I went through a quick video, and it looks really good, but they. They still only have the three factions. I was just wondering if you guys, I know you were into it at some point um, mm-hmm. and uh, have moved around. Or, have you heard any news on it? Is there going to be anything you know, coming more to light on that game or is it just kind of, I mean, there's new starter sets and I was like, ah, oh, so looks did like you, I got to buy a new starter set oh, to go oh, again. Did you ooh, follow ooh, the? Ooh, ooh, ooh let you, me, let oh, me okay, feel this ahead. one. <laughs> I, I'm the new expert. <laughs> Nice. Okay. I, I, intriguingly, this is exactly what the next did you ever notice is all Very about. recent topic. We've been talking a lot about dust lately. Yeah. Uh, oh. du- uh, uh, and nobody knows for sure whether it was Dust Studios or Battlefront, but one of the two of them just finished this week a huge Kickstarter for, ba- uh, for um, Dust Tactics 2.0 with a whole new campaign theme in Africa. So... Everything, all of the premium painted models are all in tropical uh, camo, and uh, all of the models are like in short sleeve shirts and stuff like that. Uh, the models looked amazing. The, the 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 tropical versions of all the walkers were really cool, like open topped and stuff like that. Um, it made a crap ton of money. It made somewhere between four hundred fifty and five hundred fifty thousand dollars. And there's no telling exactly how much because they did a whole new thing that no one's ever done before where they actually folded uh, local professional game stores into the Kickstarter and allowed game stores to be sort of hubs for Kickstarter ordering. And so um, the numbers – all the numbers w- weren't reflected in the Kickstarter number because you had all these other things that they were fielding at the same time. Uh, so it was a very, very, very successful Kickstarter. I was in there for $150. Then I was in there for $300. And then I pulled down to a dollar. And then I jumped out completely in the last day. Because it's if, if you like Dust Tactics, now is an awesome time to be involved with the game. That was a full-court press 
the equivalent of, I think they said, two years of releases got funded by the Kickstarter. Awesome looking stuff. Really, really cool. They were giving away all kinds of great stuff. Uh, you know, it wasn't like a cool mini or not level plastic flood, but it was some really, really cool stuff uh, at really, really decent prices. The the reason I pulled out is that I've never enjoyed Dust Tactics at all. Uh, I love Dust Warfare. Everybody knows that's listened to the show that I love Dust Warfare, that I think it's one of the greatest army scale miniatures games at that scale, that 28 millimeter scale that's ever come out. I would much rather play that, excuse me, in a dynamic environment than I would pretty much anything else. And there's this huge mystery surrounding uh, Dust Str- Dust Warfare and Battlefront and Dust Studios and Fantasy Flight Games and everybody's going to tell you, oh, we don't really know. Um, uh, we can't really tell you. We can't really disclose everything that went on with that negotiation. But the, 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 the baseline is that Fantasy Flight developed Battle... Uh, why do I keep messing that up? Dust Warfare. Uh, Warfare. Mm-hmm. They, they developed Dust Warfare on their own, at, and, and it was their own thing. So when Battlefront acquired Dust properties, they did not acquire warfare and no one can do anything with warfare until some undisclosed future date that no one will ever talk about so all they say is well we can't really do anything with it so they 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 do they can do new things like the cards the deck of cards that update all of the uh all the current models and that's pretty much all they can do they they put a card in with every model that they sell now so that it's warfare stats. You'll have the warfare stats in a in a card anyway. You won't get it in a book. But um, the key is there's like no no real development, um, and nobody knows when it will be developed. And in this new 2.0 version of Dust Tactics, they introduced this thing called Dust Battlefield, which might be why I keep saying battle. And Dust Battlefield is. Dust tactics, but you get rid of the grid, so everything's measured. So and it's kind of co- like warfare. It's not really because it doesn't have any of the stuff that made warfare really cool and yeah. unique. It basically is dust tactics without a grid, so you're measuring stuff out. So it doesn't have the pinning. It doesn't have the um, uh, I don't know it, uh, it, phase it, and the it, suppression yeah, fire. It doesn't have the suppression fire. It yeah so. Um, it really lacks all, any of that sort of depth and color that I really enjoyed. All from the innovative Dust. mechanics we like. <laughs> exactly. The game, basically, that Fantasy Flight made is not there. It's right. Dust Tactics, which has never grasped me and never will. Um, and so that's why I pulled out because it, it seems to me as if there is no commitment. No, it, if a single person involved with either Battlefront or Dust Studios had jumped out and said, "We're one. On, we're behind it 100. percent We love Dust Warfare. We're going to do great things with it in the future. Don't you worry. Just send. and then they wouldn't do that. They would just be like, "We don't know. We can't do it. We don't know when. Blah blah blah." And and that sort of hesitancy and 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 failure to make any sort of definitive statement really really crushed me and crushed my excitement in the whole uh, Kickstarter. And I pulled out. So if you do in fact like Dust. Tactics. tactics. Now is a great time to be a Dust Tactics player. If you like Dust Warfare, you can still play with all the cool stuff, and every new thing that comes out is going to have stats. But the game itself, as far as, as as a second rule book or expansions, it's basically in limbo right now. So yeah. that's the status of Dust as I know it. And what do I know? I just did like four hours of research this week before <laughs> pulling my. Uh, well, and well, and all of that information could be wrong because it's all from the internet. So right. all I know is, but I did spend two hours going through every comment by the officials in the in the Kickstarter, looking desperately hoping for uh, any sign that that there was a commitment there, and I didn't find anything. Right. Well, I'm gonna wait for. Uh to listen to the Dead Zone review then before I make any moves. Oh, such a good game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would definitely wait for the Dead Zone review, which is, um, well, up right yeah. now, actually. Yeah. Um, one other thing, too, uh, this was an interesting rumor. So, Bell of Lost Souls and other websites communicated from the Kickstarter that there was actually a fourth faction announced for Dust Tactics uh, and, by extension, Dust Warfare. But um, there's some confusion around of that. What actually happened was one of the stretch goals introduced a mercenary unit 
um, single squad, a single squad. Uh, and the interpretation some people had on that was that was the fourth faction. It was mercenaries. But um, as far as everybody can tell, that's not the case. It's, it's just a single Merc squad. It's not the fourth yeah. faction. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, unfortunately, because I've... But I have had from very unreliable sources that there are new factions coming out of Gen Con this year, or a new faction coming out of Gen Con a this new year. Faction. So we'll see what uh, happens. Although I'm, I don't know. But the Kickstarter actually no, indicated no. that the next that the Japanese faction was like a year out. Oh, so. uh, well. But all that right. wasn't official. That was just all the rabid yeah. fans talking. But we'll see. I don't know. All right. So... Um, Let's see. Uh, oh, John's got a question, but also, um, don't forget, if you have a question, make sure you type it in the old uh, Skype chat here. So, John, what was your question? Um, yeah, so after listening to your podcast for a few years, I finally decided to start a gaming group. So oh, I nice. had my first one last week, and it went pretty well. So I was just, cool. we had about a dozen people. That's and awesome. most of them are, for lack of a better term, uh, casual gamers, mm-hmm. and a couple are more hardcore. So I was wondering how you guys like manage that in like a larger gaming group cool uh craig you want this one or you want me to do it no no you take this one. <laughs> well, well, i talked a lot in the last one. I'm, gonna, the, I'm gonna go get a drink i think the key to managing quote unquote managing a gaming group is not to try to manage it too much yeah. um the key to get people playing regularly and coming back is to make sure at least a, a small core group of people that are fun to play with always show up every week and the way to do that if you're trying to start the gaming group is you got to be that guy so um just show up every whatever your day is and have a couple fun games, and just keep playing them, and those people will tell two friends, and before you know it, you'll get slow growth. And then of those people, a couple more of them will come sort of become alpha gamers and be like, hey guys, I had this game too, I'd love to try it, but hey, bring it on in, show everybody that game, teach us that game. I'm, you know, you, I always joke about that, I'm like, I'm, I'm tired of being the guy teaching rules, please someone teach me some rules. Mm-hmm. You know, so just do that, but I think the key is just to keep coming, make it regular, make it the same night every week, make it roughly the same time every week, and in the beginning, some people, you got to read the group too, because some people like the rotating different kinds of games all the time. Some people don't. Some people prefer to master it. Some people like, you know, also different kinds of gamers, as you've already identified. You got casual gamers there. So, like, are you playing, like, really the short filler type games, like Bang the Dice game and stuff? Or are you playing, like, what kind of games are you guys playing? Um, yeah, we're doing, like, uh, you know, King of Tokyo, yeah. Illustrations, Resistance, those types of games. Yeah, perfect. And then after a couple hours, we kind of. After some people have left, we kind of pull out the longer, more you yeah. know, nerdier games. And yeah, you can try to you can try to slide them in, like you know, maybe survive, escape from Atlantis or Small World, because those games have a little more meat on them, but they still you know they're still light. And then if you really want to hook somebody, then just go with uh, Lords of Waterdeep. Just kind of bring Lords of Waterdeep in the basic game, because that game seems to appeal to like everybody. I, I don't think I have found someone who doesn't like Lords of Waterdeep, except for hardcore hardcore gamer gamers who are like this is such a reboot of Kalos or whatever you know right but but casual gamers is like this is fun even if they're not D guys or gals so i would i would just do that if you're trying to get to meteor games just kind of slowly introduce those and you'll find a happy medium but i've got even in our group now which is pretty big there are games we have groups of, of people in there that simply they gravitate to certain kinds of games we have people who play miniature games we have people who will never touch a board game and people who play board games or touch miniature games and what I try to do is I, I'm in and out all the time. So I'll be like, oh, this week I feel like, I mean, I'm there, but I'm in and out different types of games. So I'll blog on like a board game streak for like two months. And then I'll take a break and I'll do miniature work. I'll just play War Machine constantly or, or Dead Zone or whatever the hotness is for two months. And then I'll come back and do something else. So, um, But what's great about doing that is I get to hang out with different members of the gaming group. It's like, oh, I haven't played with you in so long, Randy. It's great to sit down with you and play with some games. So it's that kind of thing. It's kind of like you know getting reacquainted with some of your old friends. So. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but that's that's what I do. Um, any specific questions or challenges you guys are having? Um, no, just as it's just kind of getting it going, just kind of getting a feel for it, I guess. Yeah, I would just do it regular. I, the key, that's the key. It's, it's tempting to try to make really complicated rules and stuff like that. Like we we've had folks in our group that that every once in a while, about every um, you know, once every couple of years, someone decides we need some really complicated rules or something, and they try to make all this framework around, it, which is fine. Um, but I, I found the groups, if, if they just know something's going on, people come and game. That's pretty much all you need to do, in my, my, my opinion. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Let's see. Uh, Robert has Bob, another question. Bob Jump on up, Robert. Yeah. Up onto the, up onto the soapbox. 
I was wondering if uh, also, I you know, Russ, you're big into technology and you have, I just got a, a Microsoft Surface 2 and I have friends that use tablets with their gaming for just to augment and they don't, I mean, they also play games, but they use them to have like how's their rules or codexes, whatever. And I was thinking about it and sometimes I've noticed they're still in gaming. The hard copy is is the standard. And sometimes you can get a PDF version and sometimes they'll have – like if you buy the hard copy, you get a free PDF. And do you see a trend on digital – like you know, certain magazines and newspapers are just going out of business because they can't compete with online? Mm-hmm. And I thought it would be nice that you know if you still support the hard copy, you should be able to get a PDF. And some have it, some don't. And sometimes people will say, well, I'll just go find a torrent of somebody's scan of, of, the, of the hard copy. What do you guys think about having rules on demand? I like having PDFs with indexes that you can just go right to the page that you want. I That's all li- you, Russ. Oh, I like um, – I am loving the uh, digital um, stuff from the way – I like the way Privateer does it a lot. Um, and that's not just me being a fanboy. Uh, but other companies are doing this better too. And I, I do find there is digital versions of most miniature war games are really almost full over there. GW is pretty much full on it. Now I do wish that when you bought the hard copy version, and some of the RPGs are doing this now, when you bought the hard copy version, you got the digital version as part of it. I just feel like that should be the deal. Um, but I, I try to put as much digital as I can just because I'm such a, as Craig pointed out, a magpie gamer to have to carry around the, you know, the 30 books for whatever. Um, but I, and I also like the fact that the rules can be updated at will. I, I love, I think Brian just pointed out in the chat room here, the war room for War Machine is fantastic because the F, the, the rules are all right in the app and they're all updated in real time with the FAQs. So it used to be a big challenge in miniature war gaming, even as, as recently as like four, three or four years ago. Um, and with every new miniature war game that comes out, it has this problem still where the game comes out, they're great, a lot of small, you know, th- there's so many, different permutations of what can happen in a miniature war game. Of course, there's FAQ questions that got to come out. And those things add to the rules, and you got to look them up all the time, and there's 30 or 40 different FAQs you got to find. It's great to have them all centralized. So I think that alone is worth the price of admission, um, and not having to carry the books and the searchability. Um, you know, it kind of fixes the whole index problem that I'm always, you know, whining about because you can just search. So I can just find, you know, cover mechanics or whatever or, or line of sight rules for this particular game because it's all right there. So I think it... Makes a lot of sense. I think we're seeing more of it. I wish board games would do it better. Um, like, for example, it's frustrating to me, like, Descent's a good example of this, right? So, Descent has the PDF for the rules are all online for Descent. But the quests are not. The quest, and I think Fantasy Flight does this so that you have to buy the game to have the quests, which I totally understand that, but I'd like a digital version of that as well since I already bought the game. Be able to just have it on a, you know, I, there's like, now I have like, there's five expansions for Descent. So I have five different books that are in my, you know, stuffed into my game bag that are all getting dog-eared and bent up. And it'd be great if I could pull up my tablet or whatever, just flip open to the book and find the, the immediate question I have. So I really think digital's the way to go. And I really think that uh, the companies that are moving there first are going to – I really – if you play War Machine for any period of time and then you flip to another miniature war game, you will miss the war room. I, I do. I, I find I, – I want this on every – for every game, I want this. So, so it's safe to assume that – even though we're still, uh, you know, hands-on gamers with dice and so forth, there's room for the digital. I think so. I mean, I I don't I don't see it as replacing it. Like as a miniature war gamer, right? Like I like the tactile stuff, but also as board games too, like Descent. I I don't want to. If you look at like like especially big board games, right, where there's a lot going on, and you have a, and you're, it's a huge table hog, and it's you got a six player game going on, or something like Twilight Imperium, or some other massive game, or Eclipse, or whatever. And you want to have the rules out too. It's just so much nicer to have the the iPad or your Surface over just standing there next to the table with the rules right on it. And you can just flip through and find it than having to have the six books and the FAQ printed out and all dog-eared. And you know, it's just so much easier. I, I really think it makes a lot more sense for all the games to really be that way. And then what's cool too is a lot of companies like Stronghold Games got a cool feature with this, where some of their games have built-in little bonus app features for the game that add a little music, but also add a little interactivity built-in timers for your phone. I think there's a lot of ways to kind of connect those things together and make it a really interesting experience and actually add to and not just detract from the physical presence and the fact that you're sitting across other people. Thank yeah. you. That's yeah, that, I'm, I'm starting to embrace it myself. And I'm, I'm, I've at first didn't 
think there was any room for it. But now I'm saying, oh, wait, that's pretty cool. Yeah. You can just jump right to the fact or rule that you want. And John, John just mentioned control F and he's totally right. <laughs> Being able to search real quickly is, is awesome. I mean, I'll cheat too. I'll just bring up a website. If, if a company doesn't have quote unquote a digital version of their stuff, but they've got it on PDF on their website or, or their FAQs on their website, I'll just go search it right then and there. But I like the compiled nature and I really like what, um, privateers doing and GW are doing. I just wish that both of them, and privateers are a little more affordable, but both of them are making you basically buy it twice. Uh, if you want a hard copy version also, and I do still like my hard copy version of the rule books. I love my, my all hardcover version of all the War Machine Force book, faction books and everything in my, you know, I love having that physical copy. I'm kind of like Rafe that way, but I don't carry them all to the store. And if I'm about to play a Cator player and I want to look up his guys before I play, it's, I'm not going to carry the Cator book and all my other books. I'm going to have my iPad version. So I got to buy it twice. That I don't like. I wish, I wish there was a code in the books or something that I could get me a free copy of the PDF version. And, uh, Brian mentions War Room, which yeah. you just talked about. A little bit. And I thought it was great. I have it. And for the, like, when I was playing games a a, a little while ago, uh, I used it. And I never thought twice about it. Recently, we've heard from local gamers who are big in the, the, the competitive circuit about how, uh, there are people that won't let you use it and they frown on it and blah, 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 blah. So Russ and or anyone else, is that like an issue? Because I just thought it was a great tool. Uh, I haven't seen that problem. But I know, like, um, there were concerns about battery life and if it crashes, but it seems to remember the games for me, but I've never used it competitively. I, I don't really play War Machine. As a casual gamer, I love it. Um, I don't know if it's, if there's slightly different issues in the competitive circuit with it. I, I think it's right. probably generally works pretty well, but I'm sure there are, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there can be issues that would happen that would really suck. <laughs> yeah, know, well, so. I mean, the comments I was hearing were, pretty heated and reminded me of those early days army builder comments oh yeah you know where people yeah. were like you can't use army and then now can you imagine trying to run a tournament right and people somebody didn't use army builder yeah and i think we're um, going to get to the same place eventually where it's going to be like i think in another two or two to five years you won't every game company have this something like war room it just it just yeah, makes sense so, i mean i thought it was great and i had never heard anybody local complain about it at all but recently we did hear some uh, so, some pretty heated people talking about it, but I don't know. I think it's great. Uh, Andy, what did you want to know about Andy? All right, so I asked a question about the Sylvian Wars 2.0. Um, yes. I uh, got my uh, new copy of both the big fancy Commodore Edition rulebook and, Ooh. of course, the enormous uh, uh, box set with all the cool new models in it about oh, a week and a half ago. Uh-huh. And uh, I pretty much was spending every moment I've had, which hasn't been very much even my work schedule, uh, paging through this stuff and uh, just kind of digesting it. And I got to say, I'm very, very happy with the new version of the rules. Mm, cool. The rule book um, is gorgeous. Yeah, the Commodore oh, yeah. edition yeah, is I mean, amazing. The production yeah. quality alone was worth the price, but yeah. all of the changes they made to the game were pretty much things that I wanted to see happen. <laughs> really? <laughs> doesn't always happen when no, uh, you a, know, a, yeah. a game comes nice. out with a new edition. So. The question I have for you guys was if you'd gotten a chance to look at the book and um, you know if you had what your initial impressions of it were, if you'd had a chance to try it out at all or not. So uh, Sadly, we've both exhibited a great deal of interest and said that we wanted to, and uh, neither of us have. Right. So what happened with this is <laughs> this, this was a choice. This was a tough call for me because it came out right at the same time as Dead Zone. Yeah. And so I got sucked into Dead Zone for the moment, but Dystopian Wars is on my list of things to – Upset Craig with coming back to it. In, oh, uh, I would never be upset. I'd never ever ever be <laughs> upset about. I think going it's going to be a dystopian. It's probably going to be a post Gen Con thing because I'm sure when I go to Gen Con, I know Spartan always has a really strong presence there via um, the War, War Store. Store, yeah. And they have an amazing booth. They always show the latest stuff there. And I know some of the stuff I've seen on their website is fantastic. The Commodore yeah, edition. Yeah, well, it's it's a situation where they're essentially relaunching yeah. uh, the uh, the mo- the miniatures line. I mean, all the old models will still be there, still have rules, yep. but. And we played you know, they're, Bob. They're, we played Bob yeah. under the call here. We played him in Firestorm Armada back at Adepticon. Had a great time. The new version of Firestorm Armada, by the way, is awesome also. Um, yeah, I've got those rules. been paging yeah. for those as well. So. No, they are, <laughs> they're, doing, they're doing great stuff over there, and I really want to get back into it. I, I lo- they're absolutely my – I mean, they're the only game in town, but they, not only that, they're my favorite version of any naval combat game I've ever played. Um, all their game systems are fantastic. And Dystopian Wars is really such a great – imagining of all that because it's kind of you know it's historical but it's kind of sci-fi at the same time so it's got that kind of war machine thing going on there where is it is it is it history or is it future um but i i just i really like it a lot it's a great game the models are fantastic and the new rules just sound 
as you say, exactly the kind of changes I would love to see in the game. You know, the- yeah. Well, basically everything they did is, um, you know, they took the last few fiddly bits in their uh, system and they've uh, pretty much corrected those issues. Um, nice. Just to give you a cop- top kind of two or three things, I really like that they changed. Uh, one, um, they've once again overhauled the uh, tiny flyer rules. Oh, nice. Uh, so yeah, now there's absolutely no fuel mechanic whatsoever. Yeah, that, it probably was. I liked the fuel mechanic, but it was very fiddly, but it was fun. Well, you know, the problem I had was that um, it required so many turns yeah. to refuel and rearm your yeah. tiny flyer squadrons that they were essentially one-shot weapons. Like, you, you yeah, flew them out yeah. there, you bombed something, and then that was pretty much it. By the I, time you got them ready to attack again, the game was over. I love how they implemented uh, small attack craft in, in Firestorm Armada 2. So if Dystopian Wars 2 lo- looks like Firestorm Armada 2 with a small attack craft, then I'll be in love, because I really like how they did that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's awesome similar stuff. from what I've read so far, a little different. Yeah. Um, now, basically, you can um, replenish your uh, your wings. Oh, nice. So if you get uh, one of your uh, tokens shot down, you can fly it within four inches of a carrier, and then the carrier can not only rearm the uh, rest of the uh, squadron, but can also replenish tokens up to its uh, carrier rating oh nice yeah so now now you have um a lot more resiliency and i think that means carriers are actually going to be somewhat more of a viable offensive weapon in the game than they were before so oh cool because <laughs> cool. they're so. all so cool looking you want them to have, to have some use right. yes well you know from what i've seen you know they've got these new uh quote-unquote assault carriers now so i mean basically you kind of saw this already where you had you know the french carrier for example where if you compared the french carrier to say the uh, you know the american double decker naval mm-hmm. carrier yeah. Um, you know, the American carrier was great at being a carrier. The only problem was tiny flyers weren't really all that great. <laughs> right. So, yep. Yep. And, and so now, um, you know, they've actually upped the uh, carrying capacity of the, the true dedicated carriers to like something not something like uh, nine uh, tokens instead of six. And so with between that and then the uh, the enhanced capability and flexibility given by the new carrier rules, I think they're going to be much more useful uh, in this uh, second edition than they were before. So. Very cool. Uh, well, well, you, you mentioned Firestorm. Uh, Phil, Philip Johnson over at uh, Firebase Delta says hello, Craig. Oh, thank you. How's Phil doing? He's doing well. He's going to restart uh, that podcast, and uh, he's invited me to be on that show. So I'm all excited. Oh, that's awesome, that. Robert. Congratulations. You'll be thank great. You. Everybody should check that out. Phil is awesome. Phil goes all the way back to 40K Radio, yeah, the yeah. originals. Oh. And, uh, yeah, and – um. And he's still around. He's yeah. I see him almost every Adepticon. He's a he's a a good friend of the show and a really great guy and always fun to chat with. So you're gonna have a lot of fun with that. And I bet uh, I bet it'll be good. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Hey Joel, did you have a related question on Firestorm Armada versus X Wing? We were just I think cha- he's calling you out. I am calling <laughs> we were, him out. That's we were topic. just chatting back and forth um, in the in the in the chat, saying yes. um, about which which would be better. Um, I know it's a personal opinion, but um, I love I, both games. But they're I mean, they just have great both have great merits. Depends on how fast or how long you want to play. Yeah. Well, not only, but I think what uh, what Joel was doing was Russ said that Firestorm Armada was his, or that the Spartan games are his favorite naval game bar none. Yes. And I think what Joel was saying is, hey. Like, if you had to choose between X Wing and Firestorm Armada, where would you go, Russ? Well, here's here's. And Russ is going to have... They're different. So, yeah, see, you can't pit him down. No, He's no, no, no butterfly. No, Star Wars is not a naval combat game. Star Wars is, an, is essentially an aircraft combat game in space. So Star Wars is like, is attack, is, is like the old dogfighting game. So you're basically dogfighting with Star Wars, right? I know they just introduced those two giant ships, but that's really the exception, not the rule. So in Star Wars, you're really doing fighter. You're doing small squadron fighter base maneuvers, and you're, um, you know, you're, you're worried about how many... You know, you're trying to barrel roll out of the way of a guy and do a do a Emmelman and all kinds of cool things, which makes it awesome. Um, but it's a dogfighting game, right? And, and the the one weakness Star Wars has, well, Star Wars is a weakness and a strength. First of all, they're pre painted, which look fantastic and they're awesome models to collect. But if you're a hobbyist, you could repaint them. Nothing wrong with that, but they do look pretty darn good. Um, secondly, uh, there's only two factions in Star Wars, which is a big problem. Although they're two awesome factions with lots and lots of variety. So. Dystopian Wars, in my mind, is a completely different game experience because you're looking at really naval combat. So you're looking at large, large vessels at a scale, many, many more models on the table um, at a much greater scale. Uh, you've also got ground combat involved and you have you know, do have fighters, but it's much more abstract. It's much more strategic. You're not worried about, 
you know, am I doing an Emmelman or am I getting a flanking, the, you know, I'm flanking his particular fighters, whole squadrons of fighters dealing with each other. So it's a very different scale. It's much more macro. Um, and it's not, so I don't look at Star Wars as a naval combat game. To me, it's, it's more of a squadron based. And also it's not a hobby game, but it could make it a hobby game. Whereas, um, Dystopian Wars is clearly, you know, assemble, paint, prime, all that stuff. So uh, it do depends you th- what you want. Do you, do you think that the, the X-Wing game could be the only exception to the four faction rule just because of the history that it has be- between those two factions? I'm going to use my favorite line. We, we, it's the we exce- talk about this a lot. It's the exception that proves the rule because it's the only game, like it, it's so notable that Star Wars is succeeding with only two factions that it kind of, but you're right. It is the only, but I do think though, it, well, it's hard to say because I, I think, I mean, it is doing very well. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's at tournaments everywhere. But you notice the Star Trek game is doing pretty well. And I'm a huge Star Trek fanboy, but I cannot get into that game because there's a couple problems that I just can't get past aesthetically. One of them is the scale's out of whack completely. There's ships that just don't work out. Secondly, the painting is not nearly as good as the Star Wars ones. And so I, I look at it, but the pricing's the same. So I'm like, ah, I can't really rationalize that. Um, but it does have the huge advantage of it being in the Star Trek universe. There are tons of factions. There's like, I don't know, already six or seven floating around. So I think it may be that Star Trek is doing okay because it has the, the faction flexibility as well. So it has that slight advantage over Star Wars. But you're right. I, I think what they've managed to solve with it is that because they've got this really cool option where you can build so many different fighter pilots manning the different ships, and because they have so many different, even same class of ships now with all the different, you know, the ace ships and all those other things, that there's so much depth in each faction. It's almost like there's little mini sub factions, kind of like they did with Flames of War, where you have really, there's really two sides in Flames of War, but there's all these sort of sub factions because you have the, um, you know, the, the, the African theater and desert. So I think they've kind of done that with Star Wars, which is really smart. Hey, Russ. Yeah. The other apples to oranges kind of comparison between Firestorm and, and, and X Wing, too, is that in my group, or guys that I uh, see regularly, as soon as you tell them, well, you have to assemble and paint the Firestar models. They're like, oh, I'm out. So right. you've got a whole group of minis players that are playing X-Wing that have no interest in modeling. Right. And that's sure. kind of, again, breaks the rule about, you know, just like you said about that having only two factions. You've got a, a whole fan base of people who have no interest in modeling, which, yeah. again, how do you – it's like two different camps. Yeah, I, I agree. I do agree with that. I think that's that's part of it too. They're very different experiences, but I, I like them both equally. And I have a, a lot of the Star Wars stuff, and of course, I have a uh, a large faction of Star Wars too. So, are they going to come out with a Star Destroyer? And if so, <laughs> give, given the scale, how big would it be? We keep joking that it would be it would be nine feet long. It would be the whole table, and you would you would play on top of it or something like that. I think they did. They already break the scale rule because I think the new yes. ships that came out are are not quite big enough. They're not. So it'll just be the bridge because that's all you really need to knock out to wipe one <laughs> right, of them exactly. out. Exactly. That's be... what somebody said on Tuesday. They because the uh, X Wing's right? making a lo- a big resurgence. <laughs> right. Who? What was it, Russ? It'll be what they all need is like the conning tower bridge and the two shield right, generator exactly. balls. And just put it in the corner <laughs> of the table, right? And like, there it is. Go get it. Yeah. Them. And the <laughs> and the rest of the table, the, the actual table is a mat that has a, a picture right, of right, like the Death Star. The Star Destroyer. <laughs> right. like, oh, yeah. That's all you need right. to do. It'd be awesome. <laughs> And you can play under the table, too. Or you could do, you know this is going to happen at a con, I think I've already seen it, where they have, you could do the side of the Star Destroyer going running along the whole table edge, like you're flying by the side, you know, and all the little turrets in there. And I, because we've seen already, you've seen people build up giant trench runs and stuff at various conventions, so you could do something crazy like that, too. Uh, it'd be awesome. But it, again, I, the scale is crazy. I'm, I'm really proud and pleased at Fantasy Flight. I'm so proud of Fantasy Flight that they've kept pretty hardcore on the scale for this game. Um, and it's cool that they broke it a little bit these ships because you really want something big. But I can't imagine them breaking it with a star destroyer. That would really, that would really make me sad because it would be too, it would be too small. Uh, that's cool. Uh, what else we got for questions, Craig? Let's see here. What's next? I was too busy chatting. Um. Oh, Brian, did you want to comment on? Do you, Brian, do you miss Leviathans? Did you get into that? I did. I actually went and did a demo at Gen Con last year. Yeah. Um, I got. Uh, I came back into your podcast on your Leviathans review back in the day, Ooh. and I was super excited to play it. Um, and then it just disappeared off the face of the map. It really did. And it, you know, I, I, I actually liked the mechanics of Leviathans. It reminded me very much of Mech Warrior, not in any way that the mechanics were the same, but sort of that feeling of you had a lot of detailed control of your ship, and um, I liked it a lot. It, it, I think the problem I had with the game is that the factions all kind of look the same. So. Yeah. You know, and as a miniature game, I'm like, oh, my ships look different. I want to be able to see the French very differently from the English kind of thing. Uh, 
But I don't well, think well, it, Russ is a professional naval officer. I do have to take a little bit of an exception. No, I get that, it. But, I get uh, it. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> realism is, um, you know, sometimes realism hurts you, right? So, like, I think that's, and you're right, though. They, there's no reason they should look the same. I mean, should, they should, they should probably look at whether it efficiently works, right, for the for the engineering of it. So, uh, I get it. But it's just one of those things where, I, as a as a total sci-fi nerd, I want it to be all crazy different. You know, I want the Empire to look different than the Rebels, kind of thing. But, um, you know, it's it's a great game, and especially I think. It would really appeal to someone like Andy, I think, because it's it is sort of that fantasy but realistic fantasy navy kind of thing. Oh so, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. I, I just mentioned it in chat. It's one that's definitely one of those games I bought because I heard about it on the podcast and yeah. um, didn't regret my purchase at the time. Still don't. I think it's a great game. Beautiful miniatures has a lot of potential. I'm just disappointed at how many um, stumbles it's had as far as just trying to get the the production yeah. up and running and the the additional factions and everything else going for it. Yeah, we can ask. Um, are you going to Gen Con this year? Regrettably, no. Oh. Uh, as it turns out, uh, my uh, ship is uh, changing home port in the month of August, oh, so sorry. I'm going to be uh, quite busy doing that. <laughs> minor <laughs> upheaval. Yeah, a little minor upheaval. Yes, deal, exactly. Yeah, the, the house is completely torn apart right now. The Packers are coming tomorrow. So, well, I will... Chase that ship! Chase that ship! Yeah. <laughs> I, I always try to say hi to Randa Bills and the folks over at Catalyst Game Labs every year. They always have a fantastic booth. They're always showing cool stuff. At Gen Con every year, so I'll, I'll I will ask them about how Leviathan is doing for them. And I think, we usually touch base with them there yeah. and can probably get. Uh, I mean, we get we generate a lot of third chairs from Gen Con. So. Yeah, that's a great great time. Uh, they're always very friendly. You can just you go over there and just start talking to them. Uh, the guys at Catalyst are fantastic, and they'll they'll talk your f about all their projects. So uh, you just go over and say hi. Yeah, they hit me up last year for Shadowrun Five. Yeah, oh yeah, they did. That came out great, and then they got um, oh, they got all kinds of cool stuff this year at Gen Con. So I can't wait to see their booth. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy was going to call you out on your favorite WizKids Star Trek offering, Russ. Oh. Yeah, right. we started talking a little bit about uh, Attack Wing, and so I just thought I'd bring out the point that uh, you know WizKids, in their, I don't know, genius, has somehow managed to make me buy the same exact sculpts at least three times. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> that is pretty brilliant. I've managed to avoid... So here's the thing. I've managed to avoid Attack Wing. Um precisely because of that so i have i do have fleet captains and i have the expansion with the romulans and i'll be buying the cardassian expansion at gen con it's coming out this summer so i'm sure it'll be a gen con so i'm going to be like all over that i painted as you guys know i painted all my ships for that that i love that game i love the sculpts um the scale doesn't bother me quite as much that's a little wrong on that one because you're at a macro level and you're kind of it's more strategic right it's, it's where are you in the in the universe kind of thing um, but yeah, I can't get into attack wing because mostly the scale and I'm with you. I don't want to rebuy the same models. If the models could be reused, <laughs> right, I would probably right. play it because I have them. Um, yeah, I, I think I agree with you. Um, yeah. fleet captains is the one I've enjoyed playing the most yeah. uh, by far, I think. And, um, uh, really excited about the new expansion too. Yeah. Fleet captains is, is one of my favorite games and I will play it. I play it probably once every quarter. I play it more than that, but it takes a bit of an investment, and not a lot of my friends are willing to learn it. And I like to play people who already know it, because once you know it, both sides know it, it really gets pretty deep, in my opinion. So I like them a lot. Let's see, what else we got here? Uh, uh, Robert's asking a question about demos. Robert, what's up? Um, a lot of times, we when we go to Gen Con or any other shows, and we will give up on a game simply because we just had a really bad demo. And I always feel guilty about that, because it's like, you know, we should give it another shot, have you guys? Do you ever just get bad demos and just never see it again? Because I, like Russ, you were just mentioning Fleet Captains. I wanted so much to like that game, and twice I tried it, and I was just did not strike me. And I, I, you know, I'm, I don't know what I'm missing, but it's, it was like maybe it was just a bad demo. I, 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 in my yes, I've had bad demos. In fact, I tried to like um, Attack Wing when it first came out at Gen Con and couldn't get a demo. Um, Ooh. and WizKids was doing some, they were doing some really weird things at their booth, uh, really odd things going on and they wouldn't do demos at certain times. And, and the people they had turning you away weren't really versed in personal interaction. Uh, and, and it really turned me off. I would say unless there's something about the game that's, uh, that, that's really caught your attention beyond the demo, I, I don't understand why you would feel bad. <laughs> well, to be honest, well, I mean, if it, you want to, if you want to explore further, then I would say totally explore further and don't don't avoid buying a game because the demo turned you off. If you, you know, I mean, especially nowadays, go find Rodney's got videos on almost every game under the sun that was, uh, <laughs> right. you know, being played. So you can see, um, 
watch nope. it played or other videos. If if you got a game and you saw something in there, but the demo stunk, don't definitely don't judge the game on the demo. If it's if there's something there for you, but I've I've been turned off to games. I've got too much to do anyway. So any excuse not to buy a game, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> is a good one. Well, because you know, Craig, you and I are both teachers, and you can you know when someone's an expert, but they're just not good at teaching someone. Oh yes. And I I keep having to remind myself of that when I get a demo, and I'm like. I have no idea what you're trying to tell me, you know, and then it's, you know, I just think, well, I can't, I can't give up on it, but I never get a, sometimes I just never get that second chance. And right. I was just wondering how you guys yeah. handle, nah. especially if you want to review it for the show. Yeah. Right. I, well, uh, we don't review anything for the show that we don't enjoy, or at least one of us didn't enjoy. And if not, if, I mean, there've been times when we both wanted a, 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 a demo and the demo was eh. So, I mean, we really have – the reason that you guys sort of feel that energy from us when we're demoing a game is because we only demo the stuff that we feel that way about. Right. So we've never really – I mean, we have demoed, a, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the famous uh, Are You the Traitor episode. Right. But um, for, the <laughs> most, for the most part, if we're demoing it, it's because we've already enjoyed it. And th- what it comes down to as far as us giving a game a rating – is that rating is what we think the average gamer would think, not what we think, because we're almost always loving the games that we review. So if you, if the demo was enough to turn us off, like if I got a bad demo of Dead Zone, I would still see stuff in the game that I that I would want to go further and look at further. But if the demo be, if the demo being bad was enough to turn me off, then I'm okay with being turned off. Yeah. If that makes sense. So as we, okay. as we run out of time here a little bit, I want to make sure uh, Jason and Duncan haven't said anything. Jason, do you have any questions for us? I do. Um, back in the day, you used to have conversations with Rafe about what you were doing with computer gaming. And a couple things. I'm wondering right right now what's caught your fancy mm-hmm. with computer gaming. And uh, what are the plans going forward for the, the podcast? Are you guys going to continue to cover that as a topic or is it going to be – what a great an question. Ad, an ad hoc. Kind of what, a, what a fortuitous what good timing. timing. So episode 148 just went up last night. Uh, Rafe is in the third chair. We review Dead Zone, but also we have a Tech Talk segment on there. And we talk about tech. And we bring up to date on all that stuff. So I do enjoy uh, talking about tech. And I it's it's I love it. Now, Craig, is that's not his area of expertise. Uh, or and interest. He, and he falls asleep. Or enjoyment. So, so um, I generally do it with Rafe's on there, though. But that is one of the reasons also I've tried to slide in the... Um, I try to slide in my little app of the week. I've been trying to slide into what's in the news a little bit to talk mm-hmm. about it there too a little bit, but um, to, to kind of get the next, I know a lot of, a lot of the listeners, you guys like to hear about whatever I'm playing. I don't know. Uh, not that I'm an well, expert. You also, anything, you also cover that in, um, in achievements. Right. And I try to mention achievements a couple of times. Like, um, and, and in our defense, we never covered it as a regular topic. It was almost always when I wasn't, wasn't going right. to be around or was, was ever Craig could right. make it. So, so but, we, with Rafe it when being the cats in, away. Right. Exactly. When Rafe, or actually, that would be my, I would beg them. I'd be like, guys, I need a night off. Hey, how about you guys do a computer thing? Yep. Um, I mean, with Rafe now sliding into the third chair once a quarter, it's actually going to be covered more than it used to be covered, I would guess. Yeah. So yeah, for those who don't know, Rafe is now in the show once a quarter. So, um, we always make sure he's in a third chair once every three months or so. And we will, he always grills me on technology when he's on the show. So hopefully that'll be in there at least that often. And plus the app of the week now. Our uh, yeah, app of the episode, where we call it, in, in what's in the news, should also give you a little bit of, a little bit of technology, technology stuff. No. Um, also, I do. Someone's talking about in the chat room now about um, Tales of Honor. Um, oh. I actually, Craig's really enjoying it. Actually, Craig introduced me to the game. This is the first video game ever yeah. that Craig has actually shown me, which is pretty awesome. I do talk about it briefly as the app of the w- episode in the 148 went up last night, uh, and then Craig and I talk a little bit about it more. In an achievements in gaming, but that's not until like episode 150. <laughs> it's kind of strange. It's space time. Right. Continuum, it's, but, we, yeah, we've but anyway, gotta, coming out a little later. But yeah. yes, Tales of Honor is, is, it's one of those games where it's free. It's got in-app purpose purchases, but I've made it pretty far without actually spending a dime. Um, yeah. if you can be patient with it, you can get, do well. It's a pretty <laughs> nice little game. And actually, I finally found a reference to the books. Oh I mean, yeah, not just a not just. Oh no I mean, no oh yeah. Oh, do you know what time period you're dealing with now? Yes, that I do. That was awesome when I yes, found out. Yes, that was awesome. 
So I don't want to spoil I would, anything. I would actually. Uh, Andy says it's not. Mu- it doesn't much capture the honorverse combat, Andy, I and not to not not to call your expertise into. Well, question, he is a naval of officer, so you got to be careful. Andy. I know. I'm being very careful. <laughs> But I think oh, that's it's right. got. That's right. Go ahead. I probably deserve it. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm not going to school you. I'm just going to say it. It has enough nods to it. Yeah. That that I love the like. I mean, the names oh, of yeah, the missiles no, are I, I similar. Really they're rolling the ship nods, and so. yeah. My my point was that you know if you're expecting to be rolling pods and having these massive fleet engagements, that's not really what this game is about. Yeah. yeah. Although no. I have heard rumors that there are pods later in the game. And Ooh. I have faced some bad guys who have launched such a massive initial yes. wave at me that is th- not even close to subsequent waves that the only thing I can come up with is that they're rolling pods on me. Yeah. Uh, although at the same time, you have to understand that where this, when, when this is taking place in the Honorverse, there aren't pods actually now that I think of it. Yeah. Well, you'll find that out. It sounds, play- sounds like I just need to stick with it because I'm not really all that far into it. Part yeah. of my problem is it requires an internet connection to play. Yeah, that's yeah, kind of sticky. Yeah, that's so, that's, that's uh, so I don't have uh, a lot of internet access sometimes. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, really? That's so weird. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. And it takes forever to load on my phone every time yeah. I try to yeah. play it. Uh, but just, which just one one thing that I kind of wanted to follow up with that though was, what do you think of the um, as far as the stuff on the website, like the treatments they're giving to the character design, some of the stuff in the comics, the way they're uh, d- depicting the ships and the technology and the universe. Um, well, I actually got to sit in when I went to HonorCon. I got to sit in with the uh, Evergreen Studio staff on a big presentation about the movies and the concept art, and I took pictures of of Warshawski sails and I took pictures of coming in and out of warps and gravity wells and it was amazing and at the end they were like of course we don't want you sharing any of the images you just took <laughs> so my phone was full of absolute <laughs> solid gold that I couldn't actually post anywhere so I showed it to all my friends when I got home <laughs> but um I mean a lot of it is different and they have a lot of good reasons why a lot of it is different I mean actually to go back to your Leviathan's conversation of course in the in the Honorverse books all the ships pretty much look identical because they're yeah, all working on yeah, the same exactly. physics. And what they had to do, and what they, what they said they had to do, and I and I mean, I it, it's it's cool enough looking that I buy it. Well, is that they needed like me, they needed maybe. both sides <laughs> to be so visually different that a novice who never saw anything about, never read it, never could just walk into the movie and say, "Oh yeah, those guys and those guys are on different sides." Yeah, and I know, mean. I, I, I think that's a great point. This actually throws back to that video I linked you to on uh, the uh, the Patreon website. Is, you know, they're they're not making this movie for naval technology nerds like me. They're right. they're making this for right. people who may have never even heard of Honor Harrington before. Yes. And you know, from that respect, I don't really mind it. And I'm actually really excited to think that uh, you know a universe that I've really come to know and love is going to get you know that kind of mass market exposure and be introduced yeah. to a bunch of people who may have never even heard of it otherwise. Yeah. The only thing that I've got an issue with right now is tree cats. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't isn't like quite those. Yeah, cuddly yeah. fluffball is supposed to be right now. <laughs> no, I don't like. I don't like the concept art that I've seen on the tree cats. But other than that, uh, I'm pretty much. I'm pretty. Okay. I can't think of anything that I was that I'm not really excited about uh, as far as how how it's shaping up. Um, nice. And and as far as like as far as HonorCon went to to continue that theme and talk about um, you know naval technology geeks and stuff like that. Uh, HonorCon was awesome because it had entire panels that were nothing ab- n- about nothing but the technology and there was one there was actually one panel with David Weber on how he uh he took a modern naval structure and designed a space naval structure out of it and there was a guy from the Naval War College uh Chris Weave was there actually there there were yeah, two his, naval his guest appearance is still one of my favorite things about or favorite episodes Oh uh, he's show. he was oh, awesome he's brilliant yeah really he was good. absolutely yeah. awesome and that friend of his the guy I don't know he did this minor game harpoon I don't know um <laughs> that was the most embarrassing moment I've ever had on um <laughs> rapid fire. fire but anyway um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, HonorCon has just got guys like that walking everywhere, and they're talking about all this stuff. And they're not just talking about Honor Harrington. They're talking about the you know real-world Navy and all this other stuff. And then there's the writer's track, and then there's the history track. So it was really an amazing weekend. Uh, and it had all this stuff. And literally everybody from the president and CEO of 
Evergreen Studios down to the uh, their primary production assistant. Their entire staff was there uh, taking questions. I got to play the first demo of the um, Tales of Honor app game. Uh, so, I mean, it was just a crazy great experience. So I would highly recommend next year. They're, they're saying they're going to do it again. So I would I recommend that to anybody who got a chance to see it, especially if you're a fan of Honor Harrington. But uh, we... How we doing on time? Well, we're going Plus. along here. Uh, Duncan, uh, you didn't get chased. Oh, anything, Duncan said he had so a question. I want to make sure Duncan yeah, gets a question. I, I just have a quick question. I'm just starting to play Descent 2 now, and I was just wondering what you thought was the best sort of combination of expansions and things. Oh, Don't well. be the overlord. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> it depends I on think your, I will be. It depends <laughs> on your hero count. So, so what I found with Descent 2 is that the overlord has an advantage if there's only two heroes. It's about okay. equal with three heroes, and the heroes have a uh, an advantage um, if there's four heroes. So I don't know what your playgroup size is going to be, but uh, I think it'll be four most of the time. Yeah, like four heroes, which is fine, time. especially first playthrough. Now, the uh, I would also say that the core set is definitely leans in favor of the heroes, especially if there's four of them. However, later yep. expansions have really given the Overlord a lot of tools to be very dangerous with, uh, not the least of which actually. If you were going to add just one thing uh, to your base set, I would actually add one of the well, two, one of the lieutenants. So yeah, I got most of those because I like to paint the figures. Oh, right? awesome! Because all the lieutenants, you don't. First of all, if if you want the figures because they they make all kinds of appearances in the campaign, obviously you, you want to buy them all anyway. But even without the 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 figures, what the lieutenants do is they give you this extra mechanic in the game where you, as the overlord, can choose one mechanic. Or I'm sorry, one one lieutenant to be your um, so your your key dude, your minion, and this guy he gives you a special deck of cards that you can then use and buy from with this whole new mechanic in the game called threat, and you get threat in a variety of ways. And one of the best ways you get threat is when you kill heroes, so it makes okay. killing heroes more valuable to the overlord, which is great because a lot of times killing a hero they just get right back up. So it's kind of like anticlimactic. You like work so hard to kill a hero, but threat is a permanent resource that you can then use and spend for permanent abilities that stay face up on the table. You don't have to draw. And you can use in the middle of the game to do really amazing stuff, including summoning your your mini, your special kick-butt dude into the middle of a game where he's not supposed to be. So you can basically bring one of these lieutenants into a battle where he wouldn't normally exist, and it really can throw a wrench in the hero's plans. But it's very expensive and threat to do this, so you want to wait for the right moments where you really need that extra bit to go over the top. And it really gives you an extra strategic advantage, and it really makes the heroes worried about it too. And then what's neat about this is if they don't kill that guy and just, just ignore him, it's cheaper for you to bring him back every time. If they kill him, it becomes much more expensive for you to get him back. So there's really some nice mechanics there. Um, great stuff. That would be the one expansion I would add, which is actually, if you only buy Will and it's pretty affordable. But some of the other expansions, most of the other expansions add more monsters, which you don't need if you're just starting out because there's plenty to choose from the core game. And but some of the other ones add other campaign stories, which are cool, but also you don't need if you're just if you haven't played before and the first story is new to you. So I would start with Lieutenant and the core set and just get a feel for the game, learn what you like, what you don't like, or what what you think it needs more of, and then take a look at the expansions, see what they bring to the bring to the game. That seems good. That seems good. It doesn't have to be an expensive game. It just is because all the models are so cool. And now what they've yeah. done to me, I think I talked about some of the other episodes. Now what they've done to me is they've released. Have you seen them? They're re-releasing the old Descent One models. I saw that because I thought about buying the update kit, and then I realized they were right. doing that. And Don't, thought, well, well, if you have do. Descent 1, like I did, I bought the update kit, which is just a deck of cards, and now I can play with all my old Descent models in Descent 2, which is fantastic. But now what they've done is... Now, some people, of course, don't have old Descent 1 models because it's out of print, so they're re-releasing the Descent 1 models in small packs of like maybe three or four monster groups plus a couple of the old Descent 1 heroes. And this would be no big deal for me because I already have all this stuff, but with these... Crafty guys at Fantasy Fight, they've done all new sculpts, and they are so much better in most cases. There's a couple that I don't like as much, but so now I'm like, oh, crud. And the worst part is they're made of a slightly better plastic, so um, if you have that problem with some of the older rubberized descent models where they can get kind of rubbery. Yeah, or, I didn't like painting those. Yeah, so the newer ones paint it much better. Um, they're, they're a harder plastic, and so now I'm like, oh, crud. So so I'm, <laughs> I'm buying all these again, even though I don't technically need them. Um, so yeah, I, I own, it's kind of like, I don't need to buy into any of those, uh, crazy Reaper miniature Kickstarters because I have enough Dungeons and Dragons type yeah. miniatures from Descent that I could pretty much do anything I need. Yeah. So, well, hey guys, thank you so much for joining us here. Yeah, We've gone much again, longer guys. than expected. Thank I you. Uh, Thanks for having us on.
Yeah, and thanks also for supporting us through Patreon. That's really a Absolutely. huge help. This stuff happens because you you're guys making, help us. So yeah, you're making a lot of stuff happen that wouldn't have happened elsewhere. So thank exactly. you. For your it's way worth it. Well, yeah, thanks. Absolutely. It is every penny. And we hope yep. to see you guys. Uh, who's going to Gen Con in this crew? Anybody? I am working at the uh, Calliope Games booth. Oh, year. nice. Well, we'll be yeah, back there. For you that. go. We'll see. We'll, then, we'll see some of you at Gen Con. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll okay. see you guys next. If you next. guys are interested, I, I also got uh, Z Man is asking for people to help demo, and so is Slugfest. Huh? Well, we'll stop by and say hi for sure. Yeah. Come by Stronghold Games. You'll see me there. Oh, excellent. Oh, we'll Bonacor's see you there. got you working there. You there. We may be there yeah. once or twice. I'm sure we will be. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks again for helping us out, and uh, we'll see you guys again. We'll do another one of these things in a couple months. And if you're not a patron, please go and check our video, blah, blah, blah. It's us and <laughs> Russ's big head, blah, blah, blah. Nice. And we would pre- appreciate your support, blah, blah, blah. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks. This edition of Did you Ever Notice is brought to you by our fine patrons from Patreon. Those listeners who have gone above and beyond the call of duty to help us set up our show in a way that we can do as much as we possibly can without spending time with all those other tedious details. So head on over to patreon.com and look for the D6 generation. Check out our video and hop on and help a little bit out. Throw us a little, throw a little cash in the pot. And in particular, this time around, I'd like to thank, and this is quite a group, Nicholas Oxley. Dean Scully, Peter Shaw, Arvid Ozma, that is four A's in one name. And to make things super interesting, Kristoff Kowalczyk. And I know I massacred the, uh, that one and I'm, I apologize profusely. Did you ever notice how some people fixate on some things in various different areas of their life, but they always seem to fixate on the same sorts of things? I, for one, admit that I am an unapologetic impedimentophile. That means that I love luggage. And I know it sounds weird, but seriously, I cannot get enough of of luggage. I love luggage. I love bags. I love bags that have little pockets in them. I love little, like, little pockets and compartments, and, and I love, like, like suitcases with all kinds of little compartments and projects and areas for different things and everything's got a place and everything in its place. And I'm a slob and I'll admit that right up front. And I will tell you the pub, unless it's being used regularly is a dumping ground for every little gaming pro right now. It's got dead zone stuff all over the place. It's got uh dread ball stuff all over, not dread ball. It's got chaos ball. Sorry. Didn't mean to get some of your hopes up. Uh, it has, um, well, my latest in what I want to talk to you about tonight, it's got Plano and toolboxes and craft boxes, all of them empty, scattered everywhere because I'm a slob. So it's weird that I love compartmentalized baggage and at the same time, I just can't be bothered to use it. Now, I don't know what that means. I'm sure it says something very strange about myself, but... But there you have it. I love having stuff in stuff. I love stuff for my stuff. Having stuff to keep my stuff in. I don't know why. I just absolutely love it. And I'm not I like exaggerating in any way. I I love briefcases. I can't tell you how many briefcases I've had since I was 14. And I've never really used a briefcase. Um, I mean, I use a satchel sort of thing for school. Uh, and, and, and it's so old. I haven't found one that I like to replace it. I've had it literally. My sister got it for me when I first started teaching, which is almost 20 years ago. So, uh, and it wasn't like super high class, high, you know, high quality stuff. It's not like, you know, leather that's aging wonderfully, uh, fine Corinthian leather. No, it's, it's, it's fallen apart, seriously. And there's more paper and plastic coming out of the seams than leather, but, uh, but I love it. I love it. It's got little pockets for everything. It's got a little area for my ID. It's got a little place for my pens. It's got a little area, little area for like playing cards, which of course every few months gets changed to different kind of cards. So I just love it. So whenever I get a new game, I l- immediately start looking for ways that I can compartmentalize it. What can I compartmentalize this game into? 
and uh, and I get all wrapped up in in buying the perfect Plano or 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 the perfect like battle foam. I I spend hours designing custom trays on Battle Foam's tray designer. Excuse me. And uh, and I love it. I love it. It it gives me almost as much pleasure as painting models. Except now. For the first time, I have found myself playing a game that I literally cannot compartmentalize. I can't find a single thing to hold this game in. And that's bad because I'm not going to be able to keep it in the little box it comes in much longer. And I'm talking to you about Disc Wars. Disc Wars is a great little game by Fantasy Flight Games. Uh, it was actually first came out in 1999 by Fantasy Flight Games. Uh, under their own IP, and then they bu- did a bunch of other things with it, and then and then it kind of died out. Um, and now they rebooted it recently, uh, in the last six months or so. It, it 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 made its debut. Everybody was watching it at Gen Con, but it didn't really come out until um, late late fall, early winter. And the new two uh, expansions are supposed to come out this month in June, which actually is over in. Uh, two days from when I'm recording this, so they'll probably miss that street date, which is a shame. So anyway, it's a great game. We're actually going to review it in a couple episodes, so uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the game now. I'm going to talk about what a pain in the keister it is to transport. Uh, it comes in a tiny little box, and this tiny little box fits, believe it or not, Four full-sized Warhammer Fantasy armies, which are actually all represented on these little discs uh, that are like the smallest disc is maybe like an inch and a half, two inches wide, and then they get bigger in diameter, and then they get bigger. There's three sizes, and there's really cool artwork on each disc. It's not like Pogs. You're not like flipping it. or There's no, uh, there's no um, uh, agility component to the game. Um, it's sort of like a, a stand-in for miniatures gaming. Again, we'll talk a, a lot about it when we review it. But the key is that it's got these discs, and the biggest disc has got to be like three inches in uh, in radius, not in diameter, in radius. So here I am. It, it, the box it comes in is is a very small box. It not even a foot on a side. It's maybe like an inch and a half high. Uh, and that's it. And it comes with four armies. It comes with a lot of terrain. It comes with some dice. It comes with a bunch of cards. And there's no compartmentalization inside the box. The problem is not only is, are the, all these discs are now loose, just rummaging, rolling around in there, unless you want to put them in baggies, which ugh, no uh, impedimenta phobe would or file. Who that would be? Oh, would you be what? What would it be like being afraid of luggage? Nah, anyway, I, I I digress. Um. So yeah, so so I, I I I've started look. I have bought four different boxes or things to keep this stuff in, and every time I bring it back, there's something wrong. There's something that doesn't work. Uh, my I have my favorite uh, to my my go to Plano is of course is the thirty six hundred series Plano box, the Prolatch Stowaway. With 5 to 20 adjustable compartments. This is what I put all of my board games in. It's awesome. It's got one large area that you can compartmentalize so the decks of cards can fit in there. Or smaller Plano boxes. Uh, And then it's got four rows of other little pieces that you can put little bits and pieces and tokens. Well... Clearly, uh, there's no area in here. I didn't even think about this. The only area in the uh, Pro Latch Stowaway that you can put any of the discs is that one large compartment, and the terrain doesn't even fit in there. Never mind the one-foot ruler that the game comes with that you need that doesn't fit in there. So there you go. The Pro Latch Stowaway thrown away. The next thing I got was uh, a toolbox that I don't even remember. I think it's like a it's a, a, a generic tool. It's not even a toolbox. It's like a um, an organizer for like nuts and bolts and stuff that I got from Walmart. And uh, it, it everything fits except for the terrain, which doesn't fit in the big giant compartments that this has. And there's too much space for everything else. So that was a pain in the butt. And then I got from um, Target, I got the Sterilite Stack and Carry cases, three-layered layer handle box and tray. 
So uh, it, uh, this is what all of my old um, Star Wars, the miniatures spaceship game, I stored a bunch of stuff. Uh, what else? Um, the uh, Crimson Skies Clicks game I stored in these. It's great. It was awesome. I managed to fit everything in except for the ruler because in no dimension does the Sterilite stack and carry – reach out to a foot long in fact it's 10 and 5 eighths inches long and that's not even enough in diam in in dia in the diagonal in a kitty quarter diagonal so i can't use that so that gets thrown away so finally i went to a bass pro shop over the weekend and i picked up a three thirty seven hundred series deep pro latch stowaway Five to 21 adjustable compartments. It's huge and it's deep and it will carry everything I need except for the rule book. So now the rule book is folded in half and it's just all messy. And it's uh, seriously, this is the stuff that keeps me up late at night. And, uh, barely there's a giant piece of terrain a big forest on one side and a big swamp on the other and that doesn't quite fit in the big giant compartment that it has and i had to cut a bunch of areas out and i had to cut a bunch of brackets out so i could fit the ruler in there but uh it fits it fits the four armies that come in the core box and that would be high elves empire chaos and orcs it, however, now it's not actually going to fit. It's going to fit probably four more armies. And the sad thing is that between the two um, expansions that are coming out, each one of those has three more armies in it. Now, one full-size army. flushing. Then it has units that flesh out the existing four armies. Then it has one detachment made up of several different units from two other armies. So... I found this and I got all excited last night when I realized that everything was going to fit in it barely because of the rule book. Uh, I'm not going to throw this across the room because it now has my full game of disc wars in it, but um, I'm, I'm going insane. I'm going crazy uh, because this isn't going to gut it either. And I don't know what else to do. And this is the first time I can ever remember this sort of agonizing failure at, a, at an epic level of uh, my stowage capability, which which really is something phenomenal, if I do say so myself. So uh, I guess that's about all I've got to say about storage boxes and Plano and Sterilite uh, for now. Um, thanks for listening, and good night. Achievement unlocked! You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by either emailing us at info at the D6 Generation.com or by posting in our official D6G episode thread at the top of the DACA discussions forum on DACADACA.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, you can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. See you in two weeks. Thanks for listening, and happy gaming. The theme from Total Fangirl comes from the soundtrack of The Last Night on Earth, The Zombie Game, courtesy of Flying Frog Productions, and is a composition of Mary Beth Magalanes. Okay. Um, there was, uh, early in the Voyager run, there was uh, uh, an episode where we sent a message through uh, a tiny wormhole mm -hmm. uh, to this Romulan on the other side, and... Uh, Essentially, the captain asked me on the bridge, she says, um, did the message go through, uh, talking about the through the wormhole? Uh, and I said, uh, my response was, like a snake through a tube, captain. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, so, <laughs> like a snake through a That's tube. That's perfect. Perfect, Derek. That's perfect. That okay. is awesome. We will use that oh, then. And I have recorded that. You're going to kill me. Awesome. Great.